Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and cherished participants, a warm welcome to the first national online conference on intercultural communication in the wake of going global. Uh, my name is Gaidi Hajid, and today I'm going to guide you through this thought-provoking and culturally enriching event. Today, we gather here to explore the ever-evolving landscape of intercultural communication in a world that is actually increasing uh, inc and increasingly interconnected and interdependent. Ladies and gentlemen, I kindly request your attention for moments of reflection and patriotism. I kindly request and invite you to join us in a moment of reflection as we listen to the divine verses from the Holy Quran. Please, I request you to pay your utmost attention as we listen to the uh, recitation of the following Quranic verses. الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين And before we officially commence our conference, we would like to invite you to join us in a moment of unity and experience listen to our national uh, and theme i kindly request you all to uh, stand and please join us in a moment of silent respect to uh, as we listen and as we play our national anthem <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Let's move together now for the spirit of learning and collaboration. And before we embark on uh, the, this exciting knowledge, let me take a moment to express our heartfelt thanks and gratitude to the, to the organizing committee, teachers, and the conference president for making this conference, this conference possible and bringing us together today. Our conference today is divided into three main sessions. The first one is the plenary session moderated by Dr. Manel Mizeb. The second one is the lightning talk session. And the last one in the afternoon uh, session will be a, a um, parallel wor workshops. So covering all these sessions will cover a wide range of topics related to intercultural communication. And before we embark on this intellectual, uh, intellectual journey, let me first remind you of the importance of a respectful and inclusive dialogue. Um, I kindly request you to uh, maintain a, an open mind, um, an open mind, uh, to maintain an open mind and actually create an environment where every voice is valued. And uh, let's officially uh, start our first national online conference on intercultural communication in the wake of going uh, global. And without further ado, let's introduce our first speaker for today, Dr. Esdin uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Um, Abdelkrim Gwesmiya. The okay, sorry, sorry, ladies and gentlemen. 
It's my great pleasure first to introduce the conference president and the spirit of our intellectual journey today, our esteemed conference president, Dr. Uh, Menel Mizeb. Dr. Menel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hadid. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first national online conference on intercultural communication in the wake of going global. Let me first thank all those who contributed to uh, making this event possible, starting with the Dean of the Faculty of Letters and Languages, uh, Professor Adel Boudiar, the Vice Dean of Postgraduation and um, External Relations, Dr. Azdin Dweeb, um, the Head of the Department, Esma Dweibiya, um, the President of the Scientific Committee, Dr. Saleh Daira, the President of the Organizing Committee, Dr. Isa Hamzawi, um, all the members of the uh, uh, Scientific Committee, and all the members of the organizing committee, especially um, Dr. Karim Ataya, Dr. Wafa Warniqi, Abdelaziz Mensi, Bilal Mellah, and uh, Amira Alleg, and Hadil Gaidi. Thank you so much for doing such a great job to ensure the success of this conference. Um, all the participants who are among us today, either here or online, uh, thank you so much for being with us. So um, the choice of the, the conference theme may, may seem a bit outdated because it dates, to, it dates back to the 1970s, at least for the West. But talking about the Algerian context, it's only recently, back in 2013, that this topic of intercultural communication is booming. Um, Therefore, organizing this conference on intercultural communication aims at uh, gathering researchers, Algerian researchers, to discuss um, their perspectives and stances about interculturality and to debate different research tenets in this field. Indeed, as globalization and internationalization uh, unfolded the world at all spheres, people find themselves um, uh, con in constant disclosure with culturally distant others, uh, either at the, at the local, the national, or international levels. So they engage, or they find themselves uh, inevitably engaged in intercultural communication that demands spe specific intercultural skills, knowledge and attitudes that allow interlocutors to effectively and appropriately communicate, to avoid misunderstandings and conflicts, and to transcend stereotypes, prejudices, and misconceptions. So one may say, I am tolerant, I am open, but I respect others' worldviews. Uh, I don't judge others, but in reality, are we really open? Um, are, are we really aware of the similarities and differences that exist between different cultural groups? Are we really, or do we really accept the, diff the fact that we are different and that our unity is in diversity? Is, sorry, yeah, is in our diversity. So the conference here is a platform where we share experiences and expertise, and it would be of higher success if we could openly engage with, with each other's voices. We hope that you expand your horizons with the plethora of topics discussed today and to anchor, anchor your savoir in matters of interest related to interculturality. Thank you again. I did the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Menel Mize, for this insightful talk. And please join me now in welcoming Dr. Salah Deira, the Conference Scientific Committee President. Dr. Salah, the floor is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, fellow researchers, 
It is with great pleasure and deep sense of pride that I welcome you to the opening of the Conference on Intercultural Communication in the wake of Going of, uh, Global. I am addressing you today, not only as the President of the Scientific Committee, but also as a passionate advocate for the essential theme we are here to explore, esteemed participants. I am thrilled to share with you some crucial information regarding the papers that have been selected to, the part to participate in the significant event. In fact, our call for papers had remarkable response with contributions from researchers and experts from various Algerian universities, including Tebesa, Oran, Omelbaki, Shlef, Batna, Khenshla, Jelfa, Lagwat, Blida, Mila, Wurgla, Biskra, Tmis Miliana, Steve, Tlemsan, Gelma, Algiers, Msila, Constantine, and Anaba, who are deeply committed to the exploration of intercultural communication in our globalized context. After an extensive and impartial review process, I am pleased to announce that out of 35 papers, 31 have been selected to be part of our conference. These papers represent rich insights, perspectives, and research findings, all centered on the theme of our conference. In fact, they stand the spectrum of intercultural communication, shedding light on various aspects of how we, of how we navigate and understand this dynamic field in our increasingly interconnected world. Over the next five hours, we will engage in discussions, workshops, and presentations that delve deep into the intricacies of intercultural communication. We will examine how individuals, organizations, and even societies are adapting to the challenge and opportunities that arise as we go global. I would be remiss not to express my gratitude to the dedicated members of our organizing committee, the tireless efforts of Dr. Mizab and the invaluable contributions of our speakers. Their support has been instrumental in bringing this conference to fruition. Thank you again for joining us at the momentous occasion. I wish you all a conference filled with inspiration, collaboration, and the promise a more interconnected and humorous world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salah Deira, for this insightful talk. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. S. Dean Dweeb, the Vice Dean of Post-Graduation and, Exter and External Relations. Dr. Dweeb, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما أشتهي أن أقطف لقسم اللغة والأدب لقسم اللغة الإنجليزية كلمات وهاجة على نشاطهم وعلى تفاعلهم وعلى مثقفتهم وعلى حوارهم وعلى تجاوزهم الحدود المعرفية لذلك أخصص تحية خاصة إلى رئيس الملتقى الدكتورة منال طبعا ميزاب وإلى رئيس اللجنة العلمية وإلى اللجنة التنظيمية على هذا الاختيار للموضوع الذي أصبح من ضرورات العصر نحن نعيش ما يسمى البرفكسيون والتكنيك أو الحوارات المعرفية لذلك أن المثاقفة في زمننا هذا أصبحت حتمية لذلك من شروط ما يسمى نجاح الأعمال الأدبية وخاصة النقدية ضروري أن تتماثل إلى ما يسمى بالمثاقفة
لأنه لولا المثاقفة ما وصلتنا المناهج النقدية الغربية خاصة منها المتمثلة في الاتجاهات الأدبية كالرومانسية والواقعية والرمزية التي حولت كثيرا من بنية الأعمال الأدبية بالإضافة إلى ذلك نحن نعيش زمن العولمة والعولمة فرضت علينا ما يسمى النصوص الحداثية التي هي من صميم ما يسمى المثاقفة لذلك إنني بحق أشعر أن هذا الموضوع يحتاج إلى قراءات وإلى حوارات وإلى تفاعلات ونحن ننتظر من السادة الأساتذة مشاركتهم لتفعيل ما يسمى المثاقفة من خلال قسم اللغة والأدب العربي لذلك أجدد تحية خاصة على هذا الاختيار الموفق ولا أملك إلا أن أقول أصالة عن نفسي كنائب عميد لكلية الأداب واللغات وباسم عميد كلية الأداب واللغات البروفيسور عادل بوديار أعلن رسميا بداية هذا الملتقى وأتمنى للجميع طبعا رحلة ثقافية مميزة وشكرا Thank you. Uh... Dr. Dean and ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's my pleasure now to welcome you to our first session in this intellectual journey, the plenary session, which is a central moment in our conference, actually, where we gather to discuss critical topics related to intercultural uh, communication. Today's session centers around intercultural communication. As we've said, we have gathered some of the foremost experts in the field to share their insights and uh, knowledge. And before we begin, a few housekeeping uh, rules, please silence your mobile phones and refrain from taking calls during the session. The session is not just for lesson, it's, it's not just about listening, it's about engaging. So I kindly request you to save your questions for the discussion <laughs> portion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached a crucial point in our conference and I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished and esteemed uh, plenary session president, Dr. Menel Mizeb, who will guide us through this uh, pivotal discussion. Dr. Menel Mizeb will bring a wealth experience and knowledge to intercultural communication. Dr. Menel, the stage is yours. Thank you, Hadil. So, we're going to be starting the plenary session. Uh, I have with me today Dr. Samia Mouess from the University of Batna II, uh, Dr. Uh, Wafa Feli from the University of Oran II, and Dr. Afaf Rabhi from Schliff University. So we will be listening to three insightful presentations uh, about interculturality in EFL, in uh, literature and <coughs> Sorry, and <coughs> and education research. So let let us start with the first presentation. Dr. Samia Mouess will talk about augmented reality (AR) for developing EFL students' interculturality. Bring other people's worlds closer to your students. The floor is yours. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before I set out on my presentation, uh, may I first uh, join the honorary president of uh, this conference in uh, congratulating Dr. Manel Mizab for this important national gathering. Uh, I'd like also to record my special and very big thank you or thank to you, Dr. Manel, for your very kind invitation to participate as a keynote speaker in your thought-provoking conference. Uh, Manel, you deserve special mention and more, as you know, usually. Thank so may I also take this occasion to pay tribute to the highly honored keynote speakers and participants who will surely make this event successful. Um, my special thanks are also due to the members of the organizing committee and scientific committee as well of this conference who played a decisive role in making this event happen. 
I welcome you all most cordially. And without any further delay, my intervention, first, let me first um, share with you my PPT presentation. Mm -hmm. Here it is. So are you following me, Manel? We still can't see it. No? Um, yes. Is it shared? Yes, it is. Just me, just skip to the first uh, slide. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay yeah. now? Yeah, we can Thank see it in diaporama mode. Thank you so much. So uh, without any further delay, uh, my intervention will focus on how using immersive digital uh, technologies in our classrooms can help foster students' intercultural knowledge, attitudes, um, skills, and awareness. So for this reason, I chose the title Augmented Reality for Developing EFL Students' Interculturality. <coughs> Sorry. Bring other people's words closer to our students. So just uh, give me or let me open a bracket that with a 20 minutes time span, it's al almost impossible to explore all the magnificent facets of the intercultural dimension. And uh, it's only a reflection. <coughs> uh, uh, and teachers can reflect on this presentation and uh, others okay for their for uh, their students um, everyday practices for example <clears throat> so i will give you a brief exposition and summary of my uh, presentation on how integrating ar into english as a foreign language instruction can enhance interculturality among students um, in today's globalized world by addressing the following questions. One, what is the role of AR in promoting cultural sensitivity in digital education? Two, how can teachers use AR within a physical space, in our case, uh, the classroom, to develop EFL learners into cultural knowledge, attitudes, uh, skills, and awareness? Uh, let me first uh, have an idea about how many of the attendees with us uh, present with us today use AR in their teaching. Uh, so, okay, uh, said it differently. Have you ever used AR as a pedagogical support in your classrooms? Just drop a yes or no uh, answer in the chat box for the interaction in the uh, later on in the uh, in the discussion session time. So this is just to tell you uh, or to have an idea of the dearth of research and development uh, of AR in our educational environments. So I, uh, I chose to talk about the intercultural teaching potential of AR because it allows a uh, situational or a situated learning experience mediated by specific technology, which is essentially grounded in social constructivism, aligning with Vygotsky's timeless concept, uh, the zone of proximal development that increases while human beings learn about the world around them uh, through instruments and artifacts. So furthermore, Modern educational technology, including augmented reality, expands the horizons of collaborative learning, dynamic and immersive experiences that enable interactive engagement with cultural contexts and intercultural scenarios. So this is to say that AR helps us learn about different cultures in digital education. So what is for sure to everyone is that in a foreign language classroom, place is just an abstract concept. 
where the language is separated from the community, the culture, and places in which it is used. And AR is, a, uh, in fact, a technology in which uh, virtual components are simultaneously combined with the real environment. And um, the other piece is that our students may have good proficiency and yet are not able to communicate effectively across cultural boundaries. As I have drawn for you this um, figure, in Agar's own words, he says, culture erases the circle around language that people usually draw. You can master grammar and the dictionary, but without culture, you won't communicate. Whereas with culture, <clears throat> sorry, you can communicate with rocky grammar and limited vocabulary. And what we want our students to have is not only the linguistic skills, although they are essential to them, but to gather with the social pragmatic competence, knowledge of the social and cultural practices, the norms, the beliefs, and their own cultures, uh, or of their own cultures, and those of others, and so forth. So this is why uh, ICC, or Intercultural Communicative Competence, is a toolkit that students are developing, empowering them to learn, adjust, and adapt. Uh, as you can see here with me in this uh, chart, adapted from Bayram and Zarat, Bayram uh, and others in two, uh, 2002, uh, cultural knowledge is important, in fact. It's a solid foundation of, uh, to learning a foreign language, but it's not enough you cannot give them or to your students enough and it's only a starting phase. Much more is needed in a language class and that their world is not limited. So my uh, presentation today is only a, a kind of reflection, as I said, and AR can be an opportunity to gain from our students' experiences with language and culture, because reflection is important, not only for teachers, but for students as well. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I have, uh, before going further, I have to stress on the fact that despite a significant volume of empirical research suggesting that AR has a positive impact on students' learning outcomes for more than 20 years since its first or the first scholarly compilations were published about augmented reality. It has goal in higher education in Algeria, at least uh, or perhaps except for some scientific fields. So let's come back to our topic, AR or augmented reality. What is augmented reality? Uh, first note that AR technology is different from VR or virtual technology or virtual reality. This, for example, let's follow with me. This and this are virtual reality. It means that once uh, someone wears a headset device, VR, takes you a step further to a whole new virtual world, let's say a computer generated environment, which is digitally created. You are completely immersed in this world until you take off your sets, your headsets. This said, virtual reality implies a complete immersion experience that shuts out of the, the physical world and transports you into an imagined environment. Whereas this, this, and this are all augmented reality. <clears throat> As you can see here, AR is characterized by interaction and integrates a part of the virtual world with the real world 
adding a three-dimensional form of AR or to AR, or an additional information like a filter placed on the face or a script, but the person or the place are real. Let me open a bracket, open a bracket here and say that while for many AR seems very much like a futuristic technology, but the truth is that it is already all around us and we just don't know it. Uh, the snap, uh, the snap chat uh, dog filter, for example, is, an, an, uh, is one of the AR uh, applications. In, uh, in our smartphones, for example, and it is uh, already powered by AR. Now, uh, look at these pictures that uh, I, uh, I have taken from a video since uh, our uh, talk today is uh, streaming live, so we couldn't, uh, or running live, uh, I couldn't, uh, show or uh, display the video for uh, it's not uh, or many of them are not in uh, the list of standards videos or uh, creative comments. Um, so this is why these pictures, as you can see with me here, which have been taken from a video using AR by placing or adding digital items or elements to a live view, often by using uh, a camera or a smartphone. Here is another example, right, where the, the place is real, the person is videotaping the place or the, uh, the monument, and at the same time, he is adding or augmenting uh, information uh, to that place, uh, writing uh, scripts in order to help uh, students or tourists know the history of the different sites, for example, here in, in London. Here are others, Piccadilly Circus. And what you can see with me here is um, uh, some of the AR apps uh, that people or students and teachers alike can use in order to augment uh, real, real scenes and uh, practices in their everyday life using, for example, the QR code or Orasma or HP Reveal uh, and many others which are really a premium and they cannot be used, but many are free of charge, or of charge, sorry, and available to teachers and students. Now, for my reflection using AR, I invite you to watch this video, uh, which I have made in order to make my students more enthusiastic about exploring their own and other users' cultural elements, which boost their confidence in connecting with individuals from other cultures.
uh, uh, I did it my way, you can do it uh, your way and invent or um, uh, just be creative if, uh, and helpful to your students in order to show their culture and our culture. And this is just an, an, um, an example of an interactive AR application that displays various cultural heritage, heritage practices surrounding common objects. You can also simulate visiting different places here and there, as you followed uh, in the, the, the video. Uh, you can also immerse yourself as an ethnographer in the homes of uh, different people in Algeria from diverse cultural backgrounds and experience with them some of the daily uh, or seasonal cultural rituals. You can also uh, see here another another video displaying a very ancient place in Batna downtown or in the city center of Batna, which is uh, Bab al Rahba. Sorry. So, sorry. You see here how I made uh, uh, right, a, a live video and some scripts which uh, denote or uh, give um, uh, a history, or a history or a, um, a short description of uh, this uh, monument, we can say monument in Batna downtown. So, uh, as I said, uh, you can use scripts which are augmented uh, right into a real, a real scene, a real video, and so on, uh, and uh, where a story is narrated and the user is asked to perform certain actions and interact with virtual and simple physical objects in an attempt to make them uh, experience different cultural customs. Okay, so to conclude, uh, if you want to foster your students into culturality, you have to be creative. So read and explore how other extended realities are revolutionizing the future of education and try to immerse them in your teaching practices. You can also invent authentic and real time and virtual travel experiences with your students as well as inviting foreign na or native speakers to engage in conversations and tours you with you and your students using AR and more. You can also follow uh, the latest developments in this field in order to bring historical sites and everyday practices live in your classes uh, in order to raise your students' curiosity. And you can also make your teaching journeys more interactive, informative, and immersive than ever before. I hope I didn't run over the time allotted to me. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Manet. Thank you so much, Dr. Mouess, for this just on time. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for this insightful presentation. Uh, and for sharing with us some uh, uh, of your reflections as far as augmented reality is concerned uh, within the context of EFL. So Dr. Mouess shared with us her experience using augmented reality in teaching EFL students, uh, specifically in enhancing their cultural sensitivity and intercultural knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Dr. Mouez has also shared with us the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality, uh, which is um, a very high difference because in virtual reality, you need certain equipments uh, masks, uh, HUDs, that is, um, how to call it, uh, a, a HUD? Headsets, headsets. 
Headsets, yes, good. Yeah, yeah. headsets, uh, you, you need um, uh, hardware and so on and so forth, which is not the case when you uh, use augmented reality. All right, uh, if you have any questions to Dr. Mawes, please drop them in the comments box. Now we shall move to the second presentation um, entitled Exploring Interculturality and Transculturality in Teaching Literary Texts, presented by Dr. Wafa Feli from the University of Oran II. Wafa, yeah. the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Manal. Good morning and welcome to my presentation. First of all, uh, let me thank the organizer of this national uh, conference, Dr. Menel Miza, and thank you all for coming here today. Well, I would like first to uh, try to uh, share my screen. Wafa, shall I share it for you or you're going to do it yourself? Uh, it, would be, it would be better because it will take some time. So it would be better if you uh, be generous enough. Sure. And no share my, my presentation. No worries. Um, sorry. No, not this one. So bear with me one minute, please. Yeah, no problem. All right. Can you see right. it? Yeah, I can see it now. Right. Just this now, will mean I would like to move, I just say next. Sure. Okay, good. Well, um, a very good morning uh, to you all. I would like uh, first to uh, show my gratitude to uh, uh, Dr. Menan Biza for her invitation. And I'm really more than happy to be uh, online now uh, talking about streaming on, on YouTube. Um, as you can see on the screen, my presentation topic is on exploring interculturality and the transculturality in teaching literary texts. So my talk is particularly uh, relevant to those of you interested in cultural studies, literary criticism, and discourse analysis. This talk also is designed to act as a springboard for discussion later. Well, in my presentation, I would focus on the major effects of a globalization on contemporary cultural studies and literary production, and of course, communication on the one hand, and the usefulness of interculturality and later transculturality on the other hand. Would you mind, please, uh, go to the uh, uh, the next? Good. Well, um, here the subject can be looked at under the following headings: first, culture; second, transculturality, interculturality then uh, broad crossing uh, literature, then transcultural reading of literary text. My first point here concerns culture and its position at the core of globalization and the globalized mobility. First of all, I would like to uh, give you an overview of the conceptual landscape for considering cultures as relational webs, departing from the traditional, the fixed definition of culture and considering the intermingling of presumably distinct cultures, pluralized uh, uh, repertoires in the everyday life practice and imaginary. Please, the next one. Well, here 
when we talk about the location of culture, we are always um, dangling between the stability and the mobility and the question of positioning culture. Uh, here, I focus on the stability and the mobility and the question of, of, of culture as related to, to the uh, broadly open scope of, of globalization. Here, the central concern of culture in the late of 20th century was divided into three notions. The first notion was multiculturalism, when talking about the immigrants and the immigrant uh, literature, then interculturality or intercultural communication, which refers to the effective cultural communication, the cultural dialogue instead of the cultural clash. And then the transculturality, which tends to deconstruct the static concept here, it deconstructs the stability of culture and of society, of a class, of nation, and insists on the multiplicity and the transformative dynamics of cultures. Next, please. Here, I invite you uh, to read together uh, some uh, definitions of, of culture by Porter and Malinowski. Um, we um, feel that we know what culture is, but when we um, apprehend this, uh, this term, we find that it's really broad. So culture refers to cumulative deposit of knowledge, experiences, beliefs, values, attitudes, meanings, um, hierarchies, religion, spatial relations, concepts of the universe acquired by a group, I'm sorry here without E, of people in the course of generation through individual and group striving. And I see here that this definition is more fixed. It's, this framework is really fixed because it is loaded to a certain group of people. And now in the second uh, definition, we find that culture is the collective programming. It's a program, in fact, uh, of the mind, which distinguishes one category of people from another. And here in Malinowski's definition, we find a, um, a direct uh, relation to the notion of the self and the other differentiation, estrangement. And uh, uh, let's here uh, go to highlight the concept of, of, of culture as uh, uh, we see in the next slide. Here, uh, I would like to put the situation into some kind of perspective. I mean challenges of teaching liter literary texts of different cultures. The first contact of students with the text reflects their um, maybe intention to explore something new through language. The central aim of uh, language and literature teaching is to prepare learners to communicate through the language learned. Teaching American literature or British literature, per se, made students uh, maybe gain a general idea about the mood, the temper, the state of mind, the attitude of the Western thought. However, as teachers of literature, we find ourselves trapped in the tropes of homogenization or polarization of communicative system. Homogenization, I mean by that, it emphasizes uh, uniformity, the standardization in cultural assimilation, integration. And the polarization, on the other hand, means rejection of cultural differences, fear of the other, clash of cultures, and promotion of cultural antagonism. Here, we need to redraw the boundaries of Western civilization and the state of mind to defy culture as fixed frame and rediscern the idea, the dichotomy of the self and the other away uh, from the idea of differentiation, distancing, estrangement, uh, and uh, uh, the idea of being different uh, in the first place. Next one, please. Here we should reconsider uh, before um, analyzing its literary text, we should, especially a text which which is uh, or which was produced in the late of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. So we should ask uh, those questions. Can we talk about, for example, post-colonial texts as transnational literary texts, and how can their cultural specificity fit into the globalized mobility agenda? And does it really challenge the standardized patterns of thought? 
Now in the next slide, we'll discover uh, a kind of a rethinking of cultural uh, globalization. Here I want to discuss in more depth the implications of cultural hybridization in the course of rethinking of cultural globalization. The second half of the 20th century, we find literary works produced by writers of different cultures, and we are actually introduced to English literatures with us, instead of one English literature being American or British. And these literary texts are produced mainly by immigrants, colonized or from mixed origins. So this here there is a shift from the fixed static notion of culture to a more pluralistic cultural intersections that also leads to an exponential development of diversities. So the notion of multiculturalism makes readers as well as specialists of literature get beyond the traditional, the fixed dichotomies of post-colonial discourses. In dealing with the boundaries of dichotomies, I mean by that uh, the West and the rest, the North and the West, uh, the, the South, the colonizer colonized, the native and the immigrant, and the national and the ethnic. So here, when reading the 21st century uh, uh, works, we find that those writers step beyond this, these dichotomies. And this is what we are going to, to explore in this, the next slide. Next, please. Okay, I'm going to uh, to continue. Uh, well, um, here uh, I make more detailed uh, recommendations regarding border crossing literature. So the new world literature is the literature produced by the 21st century writers as a purely um, uh, transcultural. Here we come as at, at the essence of uh, liberating the new uh, generation authors from the tropes of, of minorities. New world literature is the cultural production of the present era. We may also say that it is the fruit of globalization mobility of the contemporary writers. In this literature, we find a clear shift from migration, cosmopolitanism, diaspora, multiculturation, assimilation, to the integration of new concepts in teaching and delivering the cultural communication by promoting first. Um, I think in the, the next one, uh, Manel. The next. Again. Here we are. Good. Well, so um, this communication is uh, maybe attained by promoting three major ideas. First, the active participation am among students, because in new world literature, we are dealing with up-to-date topics. Second, adaptation as learning uh, or learners get to explore culture or cultural attitudes broadly known and accepted via social media. And the third one is the interaction, which is the fruit or the, the result of both participation and adaptation. Let's move to the uh, next slide. Here, uh, when talking about new world literature, we are talking about a multiple or multiple modes of modernity. So this new literature generally known as border crossing, is a new type of literature resulting from globalization, mobility, cultural confluences, and neo-nomadic life patterns. It is neo-nomadic because there is no notion of borders. It is produced by writers who narrate across, not into, but across cultural and national boundaries, less trapped 
in the traditional migrant exile sy syndrome and the even less prone to the identity questions. I would like to cite some of those writers, uh, contemporary writers, uh, like uh, Inez Baranay, Brian Castro, Alberto Mamangel from Argentina, and uh, Tim Parks. Next one, please. Okay. One, when uh, presenting uh, a certain, uh, maybe uh, contemporary work, we should first ask those questions. To which extent can we consider transcultural literature as belonging to the growing terrain of literatures of a globalized mobility? And then why transcultural communication in particular? So maybe here we will find why in the next uh, uh, slide, please. So we are moving from intercultural towards a transcultural reading of contemporary literary texts. Why? Because transculturality is a concept that captures the cultural change as diverse contemporary societies be become globalized. And this concept, which has been coined by uh, Ortiz, it has been theorized by Welsh and then readapted by Epstein uh, in the late 19th century, uh, the 20th century, is first a model of reflexive identity and cultural representation. And then it is a critical perspective that sees cultural communication as relative webs. They are here cultures. We are not talking about the clashes of culture. We are talking about the dialogic dimension of culture, the dialogue of cultures as relative webs and acknowledges the transitory, confluential, and maybe mutually transforming nature of culture. So here we find that culture is not really fixed, like the traditional idea in the beginning, but it is something which is influenced, which changes. Uh, we uh, uh, move from uh, 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 traditional to transformation to becoming. Next uh, slide, please. Here, I would like to share with you the outcomes of transcultural uh, approach in literary teaching. So first, learners develop cognitive, emotional, social qualities, engaging in dialogues and critical reflections that um, make the communicative process a catalyst for positive social change and transformation. Second, when talking about transnationality, we talk about the broadening of the cultural scope of learners. <laughs> The president one, please. And uh, no, this, the next one. Okay, thank you. Of learners, by introducing dialogic uh, framework, dialogic, I'm, I mean dialogue between uh, themselves in, in the classroom and dialogue of cultures at the same time, uh, to develop a new pedagogical understanding of complex and dynamic interrelationship between language and culture. And then it helps to create inclusive environment for communicating, interacting, learning without opposing fallacies of cultural, national, ethnic, maybe religious boundaries. It is a continual process of evolving, change, transition, and becoming. And in this way, communication from interculturality to transculturality can be seen as double voice reflection. It doesn't go in just in one way. Okay, maybe I have reached uh, the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for your precious attention and looking forward to uh, receiving your questions. Now the floor is yours, dear Manel. Thank you so much, dear Wafa. And thank you for saving us three, uh, four minutes. <laughs> right. Um, thank you, Wafa, for this fruitful and uh, informative a presentation about transcult interculturality and transculturality in literary works. So Wafa shared with us uh, her uh, stance as far as culture, transculturality and interculturality in literary works. Uh, she also talked about uh, the position of culture um, as far as mobility and stability are concerned. She has also raised um, two important uh, points 
talking about the dialogue that exists between cultures and the fact that we should not consider cultures in isolation. And she also um, uh, highlighted the pluralistic stance of culture. So we're not only dealing with global cultures, but we are also considering minority ones. So Wafa helped us through this presentation to understand that literary texts offer chances for students to um, uh, to, to, to uh, dissect or to spot culture and interculturality in literary texts uh, through dealing or through engaging with the characters of those texts and by uh, developing empathy and uh, broadening their worldviews. So students through literary texts do not only uh, develop linguistic proficiency, but they also develop awareness and sensitivity toward others. They develop personal growth, uh, knowledge about the self and others, and intercultural competence as well. All right. If you have any questions to Wafa, please drop them in the comments box. Now the last keynote speaker I have with me, Dr. Afa Farabhi from Schliff University. She's going to be talking about the challenge of power imbalances and conceptions of the global north in intercultural education research. Wafa, the floor is, uh, sorry, Afa, the floor is yours. It's okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Manal, for the introduction. I am flattered that your colleague in the beginning introduced us as expert in the field although I do consider myself very much as a novice researcher, I want to extend my gratitude to the organizing committee. Um, and I want to say well done for putting together this event. Uh, the titles are very interesting. That's the least I may say. And I want to say well done to you, I suppose, for the title. Um, going global, interculturality in the wake of going global. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, my talk is about the challenge of power imbalances and conceptions of the global north in intercultural education research. Manal, I will take five seconds to see if I can share my presentation because it would be easier for me to navigate through it. That sure. Right. Okay, sure. Thank I'll stop you. sharing. Thank you. Meanwhile, let me apologize for the background noise. If you can hear any, um, there are some construction workers upstairs. Um, we couldn't do anything about them. No worries. All right, slides. Let's see. Okay. Um, it would be challenging. Can you share my slides, Manel, please? Sorry? Can you please share my slides? Sure. Thank you. Just uh, say next whenever you would like to move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, again, the challenge of power imbalances and conceptions of the global north in intercultural education research. Next, please. Um, my agenda for this talk will cover intercultural education research, power imbalances, what are they, where are these power imbalances. I will take you through my story and we will together try to look for solutions if we can, obviously. All right, so, mm -hmm. Manal next, please. Intercultural education research calls to re envision, de center, decolonize, although I'm not very familiar with using this term, or de westernize interculturality and its derivatives have never been louder. They have never been more persistent. And most importantly, the calls, these calls continue to induce scholars to closely inspect and revise some of what what Raboul calls historical notions for excluding the underrepresented context of the global south. Unlike what I initially planned to do, um, I'm not going to try and define interculturality to you because if I'm being honest at this moment, I am not entirely sure where I stand on this 
spectrum and I don't want to get into or I do not want to intend to use interculturality and its derivatives, these being ICC, IC, intercultural education, you name it, interchangeably. I mean, well, looking at the conference agenda, for instance, we find different labels within the titles of the presentations, including, but not only, let me check here, interculturality, intercultural awareness, intercultural competence, intercultural communicative competence, intercultural orientation, etc. you name it. Now, my question is, are we aware that each of these concepts can mean something different? Or are we using them interchangeably to use the same thing? Another question is, as researchers ourselves, should we define interculturality to make sure the reader, or in our case, the listeners here, understand our conceptions or should we just assume that we all agree on one definition that most likely is coined by the global south and scholars from the west and assume that readers understand it too i'm i'm not uh, expecting any answers for these questions for the purposes of this talk obviously i want to skip the definition and tell you instead that i will focus on research within the realm of interculturality. I want to focus on these three um, bullet points you see here, conceptual level, on doing the research and writing the research. Next, please. Power imbalances. Where are these power imbalances? Interculturality related knowledges are predominantly produced by Westerners. Um, the vast majority of literature, these being theories, conceptual frameworks, definitions, are written by scholars from the Global North about the Global North, which means um, authors are from the West and the contexts they research, the, the uh, empirical studies are about concepts or are about the Global North, looking or taking as examples Byram, um, Karen Rizager, Gramsh, Darla Dildorf, Will Baker, Mil Milton Bennett, Hofstede, and so many others. More than 90% of models have been developed by the Global North. And let me use intercultural communicative competence as an example here. I am almost certain that everyone joining us now, everyone listening is aware, or at least have heard of Byram's model and the um, skills, attitudes, um, critical awareness, critical cultural awareness, knowledge, and all the five savoirs. Um, the second point, other contexts, um, no, back please, can you go back again, please? Yes, other contexts from the Global South are unfortunately underrepresented and less studied. Non-Western contexts are under-researched. When I was doing my PhD, for instance, I did not think about it. I didn't question the fact that contexts such, um, such as the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa are not on the table. Um, most of the research I did, most of the literature I have read, that being papers, research papers, books, are written by Europeans or North Americans, and only very recently East Asian ones. Next, please. Uh, point number three, researchers or scholars from the global us, uh, global south, that being us. Unfortunately, as researchers, myself included, we tend to either endorse knowledge productions of the global north and critically, whenever a new conception or theory is coined or created, we tend not to question its applicability. Rather, what we do, we accept them to be the norm or the rule and we accept to use the self-proclaimed one-size-fits-all frameworks, theories, and knowledge and apply them either to our research or to our teaching praxis. We would use, again, the example I just mentioned, Byram's model of ICC, and try to teach our students about this model, try to use this model in our uh, teachings. Or the, the second option, we just agree to disagree and decide not to use them, to completely ignore them and perhaps stick to the old-fashioned notions of communicative competence, which, again, 
is produced by the North, um, Delheims, and avoid getting into these discussions of interculturality and all these trends. The next point I want this to discuss when it comes to power imbalances, gatekeeping in publication. I am sure all the researchers in this conference, everyone listening is aware of this and feeling bad about it. If you do not publish in English, you do not exist. Does this mean that we as researchers um, should try to attain the native speaker competence only linguistically so that we can publish, so that our voices can be heard in the most reputable journals? Next, most leading journals in intercultural, communication, in intercultural communication publish articles almost exclusively from the Global North. There are two studies uh, conducted by uh, Hamza Rabul in 2022, 2021, I believe. And the findings of his studies uh, showed that only 1%, and I repeat, only 1% of the articles in five major uh, journals on intercultural communication or intercultural education research, only 1% of the authors were from Africa. And following this, the editorial board members of prominent interculturality journals are either from the US, UK, Australia or New Zealand. So where are we? Where are we really as researchers from the Global South? Next, please. Well, to make this clear, to make all of what I have said now clear, I will tell you a little bit about my story, my PhD story, through four stages or four phases. Pre-PhD, the first stage of my research, uh, the second stage of my PhD, and what I am doing now, a post-PhD. Next, please. So before I, I started my PhD, I had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever about interculturality or interculturality either as a concept or a field of research and let me tell you uh, the other day i was looking through my transcripts my master's transcripts and i realized that we did indeed have a course about interculturality or intercultural education language and culture i can't remember the exact naming but we did study that and I it was either for one year or for two years. But mind you, when I was drafting my research proposal, I only focused on culture. How can we teach culture? How can we teach foreign culture? And using technology at the time to make things easier, to make the process of teaching culture to young learners easier. And in this process of drafting the research proposal, I focused on an essentialist stand of culture. Culture is only what we have. Culture means those physical, tangible objects that we do have. Next, please. Uh, when I started my PhD, and after I did some reading, obviously, as you do, read the literature, read as much as you can, I realized two things. Uh, on the conceptual level, intercultural competence is the way to go. Well, it is the trend. We should contextualize an already established notion without doubting its relevance. And I thought at the time, we in the Middle East and North Africa, or to be specific in Algeria, we should use this. This is the trend. We are missing so much. And I didn't ask. There were no questions asked. What can a doctoral student from the Global South say about the limits of these notions? Mind you, someone um, whose English is not first or a second language, someone who comes from a completely different educational and cultural background, I was just happy and pleased to learn about these trends. Next, please. Doing the research, which is the second stage of my PhD. Um, the first stage, let me say it was about three years and the second stage only the last one year or one year and a half. Doing the research, while doing the research, I realized that there were some power imbalances in the decision making of Lancaster University Ethical Committee. Um, for those of you who are not aware of what ethics are in some higher education institutions abroad, you cannot, as a doctoral student, 
conduct a research with human beings, with participants, without asking for permission first. And how can you do this? You uh, fill in a form and you submit it to a committee at the university. You give them a detailed account of your research and then only then they decide if you can or if you are allowed to do this research or not or if there are any modifications any changes you can do um as woodin said ethics are particularly important when researching interculturally then as we may be working with different value systems what happened at the time is that the board used or applied ethical absolutism to my case. They did not take into consideration that I come from a different cultural background and that I, as a researcher from the global south, may be, believe it or not, an expert in the field. I may be able to decide what is safe and what is not safe. They tried to apply what they call universal ethics without trying to remold or reshape them to fill in my specific case and my specific agenda. And um, before we move on, I had, before I, before I came back to Algeria to conduct my interviews, um, I had to sign some papers um, in which there were instructions. And at the end of the instructions, there is a bullet point that says, if at any point you, anyone from Algeria, anyone of your participants asked you, well, why are you doing your research on culture in the United Kingdom and not here in Algeria? They said, if anyone says something like this, you stop, pack and come back. And there was this power imbalance and power relations. You come back as if it was, as if I were going to somewhere where I am the guest, where I am the other and going back to the United Kingdom would be safer for me. Next, please. Writing the research. When I came to writing the final, final draft of my thesis, to write in my PhD thesis, the, the chapters, the um, implications of my study, I used, obviously, prominent models of IC and ICC. But I realized, that, that I realized then that these are good. These are the trend. Yes, we are missing so much in Algeria, for instance, but they're not good enough. There is something missing. And as central as, for instance, using Byram always as a reference, as central as critical cultural awareness is, it should be reconsidered or it should be renamed, reshaped to fit other contexts, to fit the learner's age, to fit the learner's level, cultural backgrounds and religious backgrounds. But I didn't do anything to try to change this or to try to impose my voice, except mentioning this briefly briefly sorry at the end of my thesis saying um this should be reconsidered and this should be reshaped and we should look further than this and even examiners at my viva they didn't pay attention to this as much as they focused on the methodology next please Post PhD, which is the stage I am currently at, I keep making these reflections. What should have been done or written, for instance, during my PhD? Should I have just accepted the fact that uh, research on interculturality is predominated by the West because when they originated it, they started the whole thing and I didn't have any agency? Or should I have tried to do something to speak up or to write more about it, to write more about how it is unfair that our voices from the global south or our context are underrepresented? The other reflection I made is related to adaptation. Mind you, I moved to the UK to study for, if you count COVID and the pandemic, for five years full time. There was some sort of clinking adapting to the Western academia, Western academia norms and values. Uh, what happened is you move, you do all this research and the reading and the literature and you write and you start at some point, you start to think, I wouldn't say like them because I'll be using um, concepts I don't like to use, but you start thinking like scholars from the global south. And then when you move back again home, you you will have this reflection period, this reflection stance to think, well, 
I was lucky enough to think like that. I was lucky enough to access that that knowledge, that, those knowledge productions. But now, what should I do? Now it is my job to do something um, different. Now I should contribute to knowledge from a perspective or a perception of the global south. Next, please. Now we come to the end of my talk. Solutions. What are the solutions? What should we do as researchers? I think this conference and this this event is a perfect uh, opportunity for us to discuss this. What should we do about the fact that um, the global north is predominating the theories, the conceptual frameworks, the knowledge of intercultural education research or interculturality? Should we take the initiative to remold the knowledges we have to construct a notion that better shapes and captures the nuances of the South-South dynamics or just the global South dynamics? Or are we better off using or following the same route that we have been following for the past 10 years? And that would be me. Thank you very much, Melan. Thank you, Afif, for sharing <coughs> this insightful presentation. So, Afif uh, first raised the, the different labels that refer to interculturality, and she invited us to reflect upon them and see where we position ourselves according to our worldviews. She has also shared her story of her doctoral journey and the stages she has gone through, um, drawing a, a dichotomy between the UK, that is the global north, and Algeria, that is the south, or the MENA region. She has also raised some issues related to some issues related to publication, the programs studied here in Algeria, and so on and so forth. And she invited us at the end as a potential solution to take the initiative to remold the knowledges we have. Thank you so much, Afif. All right. So let's move on to the discussion now. Uh, please, if you have any questions or comments, you can drop them in the comments box. Now, we have two questions so far. <laughs> the first question is from Miriam Kami. Uh, I believe it's uh, to Dr. Mouez. In which courses can a teacher use such interactive videos? and in between brackets, oral expression. And do you think that time is sufficient for AR? What about the syllabus? How can a teacher implement such themes? Thank you so much, Dr. Manel. And thank you for the, uh, the participant with, uh, or the attender or attendee with us who asked me this question. In fact, uh, as you all or we all know that language is culture and culture is one part or language is one part of culture so whenever whenever a teacher has the occasion or the opportunity is available for him or her to um, to uh, practice uh, culture using ar it's affordable it's a um, uh, it's accessible so uh, it can be done whenever a teacher feels that this, um, uh, this way of uh, bringing culture to, real, uh, to the real classroom, it's, it's a good uh, tool. Uh, and I may uh, let me uh, just uh, add something. Uh, I join my voice to, uh, to that of Dr. Afef, uh, Afef Rabhi, uh, that our culture, our culture, uh, is, is uh, underrepresented. So uh, the teacher has to represent our culture in whatever course he or she feels it's possible to do so. Why? I always tell my students, especially in uh, the ethnography of communication uh, course or in pragmatics or in uh, sociolinguistics, uh, that a, um, you are the ambassadors. You are the ambassadors of your culture. 
And we know that in Algeria, we do not have only one culture, but we have a variety, a variety of different social and cultural practices in our country, as uh, uh, large and vast it is. So why not? Why not make it known and shown to the uh, to the other, the other who are always uh, um, uh, video taping their uh, their practices, their routines, and so on. Why not? We can do also. So how? Uh, and I have just uh, given you a hint uh, how splendid uh, ideas a teacher can uh, can invent from augmented reality in his classrooms or her classrooms. So this is why um, our cultures, we have the right to make our cultures also heard and seen, okay, to others. Uh, this is uh, what I can say, uh, Menel. If there is any other question to me, addressed to me, please feel free to ask it. Yes, there is a second question to you. Uh, so uh, Dr. Latifa Hafsi, who is a participant with us, she said, that your presentation was a very interesting topic. And her question is, how can we use QR code in teaching culture? She said that she usually uses it in her practical sessions of grammar, asking the students to scan codes to find exercises. But how yeah. does that work for culture? Yeah. The same thing as the, uh, because uh, the, uh, the QR itself is one way how to augment, okay, how to augment, uh, uh, objects or videos or scripts into a real object. For example, the teacher has uh, already uh, videotaped a place or uh, uh, some uh, rituals or some places around him in order to show how people are uh, behaving. behaving. Uh, in this case, the video is with him in class and he has just to, um, to scan, to scan the... Uh, to, 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 uh, or to um, uh, make uh, uh, or create a, uh, um, a link, right? A link with this video or a, uh, on a Google Drive, for example. Once in the classroom, uh, the, the students uh, will um, will scan this video on their uh, on their, for example, uh, uh, tablets or uh, smartphones and follow. What the teacher has already uh, has already uh, 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 shown for him or uh, for for them, or what uh, he has uh, uh, videotaped for them, and it's a very easy activity that uh, teachers can do in their classes. So uh, for uh, for our students who cannot uh, afford, for example, money to uh, to buy or to uh, to get this. Uh, uh, some uh, premium uh, AR applications, the QR is, uh, is already uh, uh, uploaded in their, in their smartphones and it's very easy to use it within uh, whatever uh, picture or video uh, about uh, the different practices uh, he has already videotaped. I hope right. I have answered your question or her question, uh, Manel. Yes, uh, basically it's answered. Uh, so we can see here that augmented reality is... Um, so augmented reality here is a tool that helps us in displaying uh, materials and content related to culture. And it's that content that develops ICC or intercultural communicative competence. Yeah, yeah. Right. So of, uh, we can we can develop uh, ICC through AR, uh, um, uh, teaching about the knowledge of the or the cultural knowledge about the uh, uh, the, uh, the the norms, the beliefs. I, I said it uh, previously that you can imagine whatever whatever um, specific, uh, let's say specific uh, um, competence the teacher can uh, develop in his or her students as far as uh, the intercultural communicative competence is concerned. And uh, we cannot uh, show many of the videos that are already uh, available on YouTube uh, because, as I said, uh, they, are not, uh, uh, they are not free or they are uh, 
uh, or copyright free and not in the uh, in the uh, in the standards right uh, of the videos but uh, teachers can move on to see these videos how others have used ar and the easiest of all is what i have displayed for you in the two videos that you have or you mm -hmm. followed me with or uh, through that we can uh, 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 in the, the real time, videotape a place or uh, social practice, for example, and at the same time, bring ideas or descriptions of these places to the students in order to follow you within the within the real the real uh, video. And there are different practices or different uh, ways we can use the uh, AR or MNL. So this yeah. is what I said. I repeat, the easiest of all that uh, students or teachers can take advantage of. Yeah. And from your experience, don't you think that the use or the integration of these uh, AR tools um, is time consuming and a bit distracting for the students? Yeah, for the uh, sometimes uh, I agree with you, uh, Manel, but uh, uh, for example, in the oral expression uh, module or subject, mm -hmm. uh, teachers have all uh, um, the, uh, the possibilities uh, between their hands to use whatever, whatever, um, uh, uh, may I say, uh, uh, visual ads or whatsoever and so on and uh, this is i uh, this is what i have in my mind as a teacher for about uh, 25 years of experience i don't like my students to get this knowledge as uh, rocky as i said rocky knowledge but why not experience something that will last forever in their uh, in their minds using for example such such techniques okay it will not it, if it takes uh, more time, but it will surely be of help and fruitful in the future for their uh, for our our students. Yeah, we have a comment here from Balqis. Uh, QR codes can be used to get access to some presentations mm -hmm. or in games, for instance. Um, sorry, so many different applications of yeah. AR, right? Or QR. Yeah. Or so. Yeah, QR in the same class for different cultural groups and appoint each group to represent that culturing class. Yeah, this is yeah. one. You see uh, how you see yeah. this is what I wanted, uh, Manel, from my uh, presentation is uh -huh. to uh, generate ideas to teachers. Yes. I yeah. uh, generate these ideas and apply them within their mm -hmm. classes. Yeah, that's interesting. Now we have a question to Dr. Wafa Feli. Let me. Yeah. From yes. Matt. Uh, how is it possible for a reader to explore different notions in interculturality via literary texts without being drifted off or away from his own culture? Well, uh, this is, I can consider this as the first reading of the text. Generally, when we are um, um, interested in a certain book or a certain literary text, we read it for the first time, sometimes we get shocked of what is inside. And this is being drifted away uh, of, of own, uh, our own culture. How is that? Because there is a kind of uh, comparison between what happens in a certain place and what happens in Algeria. This is the first reading. The second reading is trying to understand uh, what uh, uh, lies behind such, I don't know, uh, uh, um, uh, an event or um, an attitude or a state of mind. And this is what makes, in the second reading, what makes um, a, a culture as a relational web. Okay, so we cannot be drifted away from our cultures because we are the production of our culture, of our environment. But in the journey, uh, in the, to explore the other, we should have this kind of toleration, this kind of empathy in order to try to understand and to try to, um, uh, at the same time, not really accept, but to have a certain repertoire, a certain knowledge of the other. And this is what makes an intercultural or transcultural reading of the text more um, open, more cross 
borders uh, or, or border crossing because it's in a way um, uh, uh, maybe uh, deconstruct, this is the word, deconstruct the fixed idea we have of a certain culture and uh, our culture in, in particular. All right, uh, may I add to Abdel Majid's question here? Because sometimes when we teach literary texts to uh, novice students or beginner students, they tend to, or their critical thinking and filtering skills are not ready yet. So yeah. they tend to accept things as they are without processing them. So how can we help them through um, the readings of literary texts, especially if they are uh, fueled with interculturality and transculturality? Yes. When talking about literary texts, uh, text, always we talk about a, a certain product uh, that is artistic. I can take a literary text as uh, sometimes uh, uh, a video on TikTok, or uh, sometimes we find uh, some other manifestation of artistic element of of uh, uh, of art of uh, uh, or um, uh, an artistic dimension of culture. This is what I would like to say. So. Mm -hmm. When taken freshmen, for example, the new uh, students, they swallow everything, okay? Uh, but this is the role of the, the teacher to make this boundary between the self and the other in the beginning. And that's why I told you the first reading. The first reading always enables us to put this boundary between what I have as a repertoire, a cultural repertoire, and what they have as a heritage. And then, Developing critical thinking uh, among students is always asking why and asking how. So um, um, uh, seeing this beyond the text and asking the question, as I told you, why uh, this attitude um, was uh, manifested in such an event or why is this idea taken as cultural, why this idea ta is taken as national, as political, as, as ethnic. This is what makes students more engaged and uh, uh, more um, communicative and at the same time cultural communication inside the, the, uh, the, the course. And at the same time, we have um, maybe this opportunity to be in uh, tune with, uh, with uh, the globalized uh, mobility product, I mean, uh, internet, in which the student is not relying just on what you are giving him or her, but they rely on what they have as basic knowledge what they take as ideas, synopsis from internet, and what you give them as a guidelines in order to read the text in, in, in the proper way. And this is what I would like to, to um, highlight here, is that the, the role of the teacher here is not the role of the referee saying this is right, this is wrong. It's just guiding them in order to promote critical thinking. Because sometimes we find students who just read the text for leisure, but when you ask the student about their commentary, about something in the text that maybe strikes or uh, uh, sparks off a certain um, uh, 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 reaction, they always say that um, they are not really ready for such an adventure. So I told you, uh, maybe I have presented it in my presentation, Broadening the scope of the student comes at the core of the role of the teacher uh, of literature. So giving this, uh, this kind of, um, uh, how do I say, of um, first distancing, uh, the, uh, distancing the self from the text and then being involved in the text, I think these are the, uh, the steps that or maybe uh, most of the literature teachers uh, follow. All right. Thank you so much for uh, sharing with us this elaborative answer. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Is, is there anyone who would like to add something? I heard. Uh, Manel, may I have? Um, yeah. Sure. Sure, Doctor. Opportunity to add something since uh, teaching culture is a passion for me. Right, is a passion. This is why I always ad advise my the, my students and teachers. Uh, get out of your circle, get out of your uh, comfort zone, 
um, uh, explore your capacities to enrich your students with the different experiences and not only uh, teach monotonous, uh, monotonous uh, courses as uh, they always uh, do. Because uh, as far as uh, our Algeria is concerned, and we all know that Algeria, our Algeria is beautiful, so, and it's unique. So why not explore it with uh, our students and show how our cultures, not only culture, how our cultures um, uh, creates, uh, creates uh, new experiences to us and share them to uh, or with others, uh, those who do or who have never heard about Algeria. I, uh, I may ask my teacher or my uh, colleagues and my students to um, make this uh, possibility or this a uh, possible adventure uh, and post on, on uh, YouTube, why not? The different, uh, the different uh, practices in our country from different perspectives and augment uh, scripts, uh, the, the reality in these, in these videos. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Mouez. Yeah. Now, uh, I would like to um, raise um, or to highlight the fact uh, or uh, the point that uh, Afef has talked about, especially uh, concerning publication, which uh, and she said that we should publish in English so that we become scholars uh, who are recognized by the global north. Uh, and this is a reality, especially uh, of what we are noticing here in Algeria, all uh, subjects or all teachers researchers from all subjects need to publish in English in highly recognized and accredited journals worldwide so that the, the, the readability and uh, the credibility of the university uh, allows it to be ranked among the, the first universities. Um, for example, if we want to publish articles even for us, the ones from the, uh, the, the Department of English or the English stream, if we want to publish articles in um, journals worldwide, we, were, we, were, we are asked actually to share our data, that is to publish uh, a data note or a data article. So here in Algeria, we do not share our data, but uh, for other journals abroad, they consider this as a very crucial aspect in uh, raising or increasing the uh, readability of your article. So, Afaf, what can you tell us about this? Um, hello. Um, I didn't get the question, sorry. Uh, it's not uh, a question, but much more of a comment that... Um, yeah, when it comes to publication, unfortunately, it is not just about publishing in English that is the problem. The problem mm -hmm. is where you publish, yeah. where uh, where that be in journals, because um, you know we are all aware that journals are uh, I wouldn't say more powerful, but rather more used, um, more read when it, in comparison to books and book chapters and other resources, for instance. So the question here, as as an Algerian scholar or as a scholar researcher from the global south. Should you focus on where to publish or what to publish and in which language? And if I'm asking myself this question, I would say I would first focus on where to publish, uh, which journal. The journal has to be reputable. It has to be um, tier A or um, tier all our voices to be heard because I have read a couple of articles written by researchers within the MENA region, um, interesting researchers, interesting empirical studies, because the vast majority of these scholars or the vast majority of these publications are, well, I would say, unfortunately, uh, data-based. Uh, we haven't yet got to that extent where we focus on conceptualizing, adding adding, remodeling, or reshaping concepts and theories that already exist, with the exception of Hamza Rabul, who is who has and is doing an, um, an amazing job, if that's the right term, 
in trying to criticize, decolonize, and de-westernize um, interculturality and intercultural education research. So the question is, where should I publish? Um, should I aim high for the stars? Or should I go mid-range journals? Or should I focus on the national journals? And Manel, we all know, unfortunately, that for purposes and reasons of promotion and labilitation and all of these, we tend to accept the fact that it's okay, I can publish in a national journal as long as my paper gets through and as long as I get promoted. I can publish later in another journal, in a more um, reputable journal. But the thing is, if you are satisfied with, where, with as a scholar, if you are satisfied with excuse me for these noises, if you are satisfied no, no. with where you are now and if you just want to focus on publishing locally, nationally, then uh, our voices are not heard, our contribution to knowledge, our production, knowledge productions are not heard and read because scholars from the global north and any researchers, any readers, I myself included, when I want to do research for a piece of paper or something uh, I am doing, I'm writing, I would, first thing, first thing I would do, I would research, uh, I would go, for instance, to intercultural education research journal or language and culture uh, journal. And I would, within those journal, journals, look for papers that I can use as reference and as resources. Why? Well, if you don't publish in English, you don't exist. And if you don't publish in these five journals, for for instance, your voice is not heard. Yeah. Um, do you get my point? Yes, I get you. Yeah, especially when when it comes to the accreditation, l'habilitation, mm -hmm. there is even a conflict between uh, uh, Algerian scholars. Uh, mm -hmm. who are from technical streams and from literary yeah. streams, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the, the scientific, the scholars uh, whose background is in science and the scientific field, they have high requirements. Yeah. They have to publish in um, tier A journals to be promoted. Yeah. But for us, the bar is set low. Why? Yeah. Um, I don't know, to be honest. I don't understand why. Okay. This low bar is only demotivating us from going forward. Yeah. Well, there is a new uh, a new suggestion of um, having or of hiring in the by the bar a little bit, and all uh, teachers who are concerned with the accreditation should publish in rank A, uh, B plus, uh, B or A plus, A or B. But it's still not officially uh, That's good news. Let's hope it's... Uh, uh, Manel, Manel, may I have... Uh, sure, sure. Say a word? Uh, Manel, sure. for this, for the solution that we may find is yeah. that he, um, is to, uh, to, uh, to uh, find or to include ourselves in joint research, in yeah. joint researches with others from around the globe and those mm -hmm. who share our interests in uh, writing, for example. So yeah. those who have the main interests uh, or the, the, the interests as we have or ours, we can work with them so that we can um, expand our experience, have more accessibility to uh, high-quality um, high journals. Uh, why not, uh, why not uh, 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 publish in these mm -hmm. high-quality journals and many universities nowadays are ranked not because people are a, um, publishing alone, but because there, uh, a number of authors have contributed to one publication to show them that it's, um, it's a high quality uh, uh, writing and the idea has been shared by many. And the, uh, uh, so you understand, uh, Manel? So the yeah, more yeah, I get your point. authors or the more uh, scholars are uh, working in joint researches, the more they have this uh, occasion yeah. or opportunity to be uh, known elsewhere. Yeah. All right. Uh, sorry? Can I add something if you have some time? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Aifa. We still have two minutes. Thank you. Um, adding, adding to the uh, where to publish, uh, part it is equally important what to publish. We as scholars from the global south, 
we should not shy away from yeah. our perspectives, our conceptions when it comes to, for instance, interculturality or research within interculturality. Our voices, our conceptions, our views and opinions, they do matter. We want to publish in high uh, rip or in reputable journals. We want to publish something that is ours. We want to criticize and we want to help reshape the whole notion not just accept what has been produced, mimic it, try to apply it in our context, and then publish about it to say to the privileged uh, global north that, yeah, we like what you have produced, we tried it, we applied it, and it works like a one-size-fits-all conception or one-size-fits-all theory. Yeah, and I think that's what we should nurture in our students because throughout our academic career, we weren't told that we need to uh, make our voices heard, which is not the case in the global north. I have some colleagues who pursued their doctoral studies there. And the first thing they talk about in their doctoral journey is how to think and make the voices heard. Yeah, that is this. Uh, uh when you write your thesis abroad, there is this conception yeah. that they are, that is a recurrent one when they say your voice. And my supervisor used to say, well, where is your voice? I, I yeah. can't find your voice. I struggled to understand what she was talking about. But then it was it was life changing uh, research wise. My voice was me saying I like this and I don't like it. And I think yeah. it should be changed or it should be at least um, reshaped and reconsidered. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentations, for uh, these thought-provoking ideas. Uh, thank you for the attendees who shared with us their comments and their questions. Um, looking forward to... So for the presenters, you, you have now your certificates. Uh, you can check your emails. Your certificates are there. Um, thank you so much. Uh, looking forward to working with you in other upcoming events. Now we should move, move on to the lightning talk session. So may I just ask... Thank you, uh, Thank you so much. You're welcome. May I ask you, Dr. Afef, Dr. Samia, and Dr. Wafa, to uh, leave the studio? I'm not kicking you out, but it's <laughs> just... That, Don't that worry, we understand. Yeah, host only six. Yeah, yeah, no we need to host the others in the lightning talk session. Okay. Uh, yet, you can, you can uh, go to the YouTube channel to see what happens in, uh, in the lightning talk session. We are already in, yeah. Thank you, right. Renan. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, Bye-bye. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, was that?
just bear with us some minutes. We, uh, we are trying to get the moderator of this session on.
Hello again. And uh, sorry for the technical problems. And before we move on, I would like to thank our current speakers and remember that your questions and contributions made this session even, even more enriching. As we wrap up this discussion, remember that our conference is packed with valuable content and up next we have the lightning talks that you won't want to miss and to ensure the smooth flow and the dynamic energy of light of our lightning talk session our moderator for today's lightning talks is dr wafa warniqi <laughs> Our moderator for today's lightning talk story is Dr. Uh, Taya Karima. She is here to keep the discussions engaging, the time constraints constraints on uh, on track, and the audience actively involved. So, without any uh, further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Taya Karima. Dr. Karima, the, the platform is yours. So, good morning, everyone of you. Well, well, uh, 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 you can stop. Okay, so uh, I'm Dr. Taya Karima. I will be moderating and facilitating and replacing uh, Wafa to moderate this lighting talk. Uh, we have It's like you know, it's so refreshing. Shall I repeat from the beginning? Okay. So, uh, good morning again. Welcome. Uh, 
one for all of you. Sorry for the technical problem and uh, connectivity problems. Uh, I, I'm Dr. Taya Karima. I will uh, be uh, facilitating, presenting, and even replacing Dr. Wafa to moderate this uh, lightning talk session. Uh, so let's, uh, to avoid any kind of delay, let's start directly to present the snapshot of this presentation. We have the first presenter, Dr. Mo uh, Samia Sharfawi uh, from Larwat University. Uh, she will present a, a theme related to rising cultural, intercultural awareness among EFL students. Then we're going to move to a second presenter by Dr. Mo uh, Wafa. Uh, Nuari? Nuari from uh, Batna II University. Her presentation entitled Introspection um, uh, of East and West, a critical examination of colonial legacy and intercultural dynamics in Kamel uh, Dwet's The um, Morsault in, uh, Investigation. Then the last presenter will be Dr. Ahlam Hamzawi from Breda II University. She will present a topic related to intercultural communication. Uh, is it a tool of enhancing intercultural exchange or uh, increasing uh, tensions in today's globalized world? I'm excited about you have only five minutes to present your uh, theme, and I'm also excited about the uh, debates at the end of this lightning talk. So let's start with the first presenter, Dr. Uh, Samia. Are you here? Uh, Would morning, you please yes. open your yeah. mic? Yeah, can you hear me now? Dr. Samia from yes. uh, Lagwat University? Yes. yes, can you hear me now? We can move to the second. She's here. Where are you? Would you yeah. please open your mic or uh, yeah, test it at least? It's open already. My mic is open. Four? Yes, can you hear me? Her mic doesn't work. Okay, uh, Dr. Samia, we can't yeah. hear you. Would you please manage the technical problem with your mic? Is it okay now? Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Doctor Samia. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, can you share your screen? If not, we can share it for you. Dr. Karima, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good to see you among us. Is, is this echo from my side, Dr. Kirimo? Yeah, yeah. Okay, just a second. Okay, what about now? Is it all right? Is it all right? Dr. Kirimo, can you hear me? Dr. Kirimo? Dr. Kerima, can you hear me? Well, uh, on my part, I can hear you well. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much indeed. So uh, I was supposed to be the moderator uh, of this lightning talk, but due to some technical problems, I have asked Dr. Taya Kerima to do it instead. So please, if you can hear me, we can carry on. Yeah, Dr. Manel, Dr. Kerima, hello. Yeah. Hi, Hi, we can hear you, Wafa. Since Wafa, uh, Karima has started moderating, so can you please moderate the session together? Okay, yeah, it would be a pleasure. So just a few minutes, if you don't mind, before starting the presentations, I would like 
uh, to say some few words. <clears throat> So I would like to express my, he my heartfelt gratitude for inviting me to moderate the lightning talk of the National Conference on Intercultural Communication in the wake of going global. Uh, Dr. Manel, your leadership and dedication to fostering intercultural communication are truly commendable. It is an honor to be part of this in insightful sorry, event. So before we start, just a brief, uh, I mean, um, explanation for the students who are joining us of what a lightning talk is. So it's a very short and concise presentation of a speech typically lasting for just around five minutes. Lightning talks are uh, commonly given at conferences, meetings, or any other events. They are intended to quickly convey information, ideas, or updates on particular topics. So we are going to start by the first presenter. I guess uh, Dr. Karima has already uh, introduced her. Dr. Uh, Samia Sharfawi from Laghwat University. Um, the screen is yours. She's going to present a work entitled Raising Cultural and Intercultural Awareness Among EFL Students. You've got five minutes. Dr. Samia, are you with us? <laughs> Uh, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Okay. Would you please share my my presentation, please? I'll try to be very quick. Uh, first of all, let me just thank you all for giving us the chance to be gathered here to tackle such an interesting topic. Well, in fact, to be honest with you, this is the first time I dig deep into such kind of topics, and this is out of curiosity. My previous experiences were all about uh, different topics. I would like to thank Dr. Miza, uh, Manel Miza for giving us, for accepting us, uh, our participation and giving us the chance to participate. Well, I will be very quick concerning, because the time allotted is very, very short. So my presentation entitled Raising Cultural and Intercultural Awareness Among EFL Students. Uh, well, currently, there's no doubt that to perform better cooperation, effectively, students have to have good communication skills and almost empath empathy towards a foreign culture. That means that in the process of intercultural communication, students now have to learn the foreign culture's environment, normal standards, customs, and traditions. However, our job as foreign language teachers is to help the students of how to be aware of their own culture, cultural values before knowing the foreign cultures once and be able to make a difference. So today the challenge of developing cultural awareness is looming large and teachers have to help the students develop the ability to recognize cultural differences and form uh, cultural awareness to cooperate effectively, represent, respecting sorry, the foreign cultural, cultural values and their own values as well. So inevitably understanding a language involves not only the knowledge of grammar, phonology, and lexis, uh, but also of certain features and characteristics of the culture. Thus, uh, communicating internationally involves communicating interculturally. In other words, uh, language is part of culture and culture is part of language. Uh, the two are intricately interwoven so that one cannot separate them without losing the significance of either language or culture. First of all, I would like to give a brief definition. In fact, many experts in the field give different definitions to what culture is. But the one given by Brown is that culture is a way of life. It is the context within which we exist, think, feel, and relate to others. It is the glue that binds a group of people together. And culture also governs behavior in groups and helps us to know what other expect, others expect of us and what will happen if we do not live up to their expectations. Uh, in other words, uh, culture helps us to require the expectations of foreign cultural agents about the norms of behavior in different life situations. Culture is the difference between the cultural representatives. So uh, the first question I wanted to ask is how does intercultural communication happen? So experts in the sphere of intercultural communication, mainly Bradilla and Byron and Delanoy, emphasize that intercultural cooperation could not always happen in accordance with the standards and norms of a foreign culture. The culture agents should be aware of the logic of the foreign culture. And more, moreover, they have to critically approach and be aware of their own culture. 
Uh, this means that language le learning equals cultural study. These are part of the whole. That is why the foreign language teachers have to teach cultural awareness simultaneously with language teaching. Cultural awareness, what do we mean by the, uh, by the concept? So we have now to consider what is meant by cultural awareness. Uh, according to scientists, mainly Tomilson and Masura, uh, cultural awareness consists of perceptions of our uh, own and other people's cultures, and these perceptions are put as follows. We have the eternal ones, which may develop in our mind, and dynamic, that are constantly being added to and changed, variable, they are modified from experience and multidimensional. They are represented through sensory images, for example, mental pictures, mental connections, and effective associations, as well as through the inner voice. Interactive in that they connect with and with and inform each other. So this means that cultural awareness development uh, process will take a lot of attempts and energy to achieve the goal. The tolerance towards the foreign culture parallelly with the cultural self-identification. So cultural awareness involves uh, a gradual, gradually developing inner sense of the equality of cultures and increase in understanding of our own and other people's cultures as well, and a positive interest in how cultures both connect and differ. So such awareness can broaden the mind, increase tolerance, and facilitate international communication. This is according to Tom Olson, 2001. So the level of personality development will mean that a person is aware of basic values of their own and foreign, uh, the ones of the foreign cultures. That level of personality development will help the, to successfully communicate in multinational environments. Now, the thing that I wanted to highlight is that increased cultural knowledge can give us increased credibility and expertise and increased cultural sensitivity. It can facilitate language, acquisition as well as as being positive empathetic and inquisitive it can also contribute to one of the optimal conditions for language acquisition motivated exposure to language in use so achieving the, the level of cultural empathy and sensitivity a person shares the values of foreign culture this means they are feeling comfortable when communicating amongst foreigners also they can effectively cooperate with different cultural agents working uh, globally so the logic of foreign culture, this is the basic thing that foreign language students need to know before being even introduced to the language itself that they are studying, be it uh, any other foreign language, French, Spanish, or German, uh, whatsoever. So people, when communicating with foreign cultural agents, are supposed to adequately respond to the expectations from them. To do so, they have to deeply understand the logic of a foreign culture, comparing it inevitably with their own. This, in their uh, terms, means that the person should first share the basic values of the foreign culture. This is very important. Know the norms of behavior in different everyday life situations. And last, speak the language adequately. So by the language of foreign culture, we mean the basis platform for explanation of every act of speech or behavior uh, of a foreign culture agent. To speak the language adequately means to not understand, to, to not sound strange for foreigners. So to master cultural awareness is a successful step to tolerance and effective communication in different situations of everyday life and work and at work. So we believe this process, we will take a lot of time and effort, but with the help of the teacher, whose aim is to develop the student's cultural awareness, these skills could likely be trained faster and more successfully. So what is the, uh, the cultural uh, awareness approach? So after we have considered that what cultural awareness involves, we have now to elaborate on the cultural awareness approach in teaching foreign languages. This is the most important thing. So following the professionals in the area, experts, as I'm not really um, too much knowledgeable about the topic. So this is what uh, experts uh, uh, have provided us with as teachers. So we consider the principles, objectives, and steps of the cultural awareness teaching approach. So according to Tomlinson, uh, always, the main learning principles of, of a cultural awareness approach involves the encouragement of these most important uh, points. So learning from experience, apprehension before comprehension, and effective and cognitive engagement with an encounter, be it a text or a task, uh, intake responses to an encounter, text or task in the sense of developing and articulating representations of, of the experience, 
discovering clues to the interpretation of an experience by reflecting on that experience and tolerance of ambiguity that is not worrying about not being able to interpret and to in, interpret an experience or not fixing an immediate and absolute interpretation so these principles uh, believe as believed by um, Tomilson are coherent in the sense that they connect with each other and have been developed to facilitate, facilitate the deep processing of experience, which can lead to informed awareness, sensitivity and empathy, and to a large extent, language acquisition. So again, Tomilson also states that the main objectives of the cultural awareness approach are to help the learners to uh, discover assumptions, values, attitudes that underline the utterances and behaviors of other peoples in other cultures. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Sami, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just would like to kindly remind you that you should yeah. respect the five minutes. You have already exceeded yeah. them. Yeah. It's like impossible for me to cover every uh, point in my presentation. I will go directly to the um, uh, maybe. Uh, cultural awareness implementation as a teacher of speaking skill in my classes, I always highlight the importance of uh, differentiating our own uh, culture and the culture of the language studied. So I always try to remind the students of the boundaries of their own culture and the uh, the culture, uh, the language of the culture they are studying. These could be done through examples, for example, raising. I remember once I, uh, I picked a topic entitled uh, like etiquettes, the British etiquettes, like uh, where the students can talk about eating etiquettes and uh, introducing people and maybe, uh, uh, I mean, different aspects of etiquettes. And I asked them to, to mention some of their own. And one of the students was trying to be funny and he said, we don't have any etiquettes like in Algeria. He was trying to be funny. And I let him like continue his, uh, like his claim. And by the end, we, which is our job as teachers is to remind them uh, of, their, of, of our own uh, cultural Arabic, religious back, uh, background, especially as Muslims, okay? And then I reminded them that we have eaten etiquettes, like to say Bismillah, to use your right hand. When in the streets, for example, and an old lady we, we in passing across in the street, we may help uh, them with these uh, things. Maybe in the bus, we can help also old people. And we highlighted other uh, etiquettes as well. So. The, the bad thing the, about etic culture, for example, as is the, the main topic, is that... Samia? Yes. Okay, um, you are expecting the time offered for your presentation. I mean that lightning talk. Yes. Suppose that you have only five minutes. So should I just uh, skip that? Just skip some details. Uh, go to the conclusion, please. So after we have considered the issue of cultural awareness, we arrived at the conclusion uh, that this notion is extremely important currently. It has a great impact on communication and negotiations in the first place within any environment. Addressing the cultural awareness properly, people can effectively build good cross-cultural business relations, for example. Uh, moreover, uh, future professionals who will not be able to distinguish and respect the cultural divers diversity and ignore them because they have not been taught, having lack of cultural awareness, um, will not be able to construct effective and successful communication. So this undoubtedly will lead to breakdowns in communication and relationships. Currently, it is the language teaching professional's duty to look for uh, professional development opportunities that enable future professionals to understand uh, cultural processes uh, better. This is all I can say about my presentation. Sorry, I could not respect the, the time alluded. Um, Indeed. <laughs> it should be a presentation, not a lightning talk, though we have benefited so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Samia. It was really interesting. Um, I wish it could have been a presentation rather than just a lightning talk. I would like to welcome all questions. Please prepare your questions by the end of this lightning talks. We are going to have a debate, a fruitful debate all together. So thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Let me invite the second speaker, Dr. Nwari Wafa. Are you here? Yeah, Dr. Wafa Nwari from Betna University. Are you here, Wafa? 
Hello, Dr. Wolfgang. Dr. Nawari, can you hear me? No, no. She is not here, actually. Ah, she is not here. So let me invite the third speaker in order to not to respond. Dr. Islam Hamzawi from Blida 2 University. Are you here, Dr. Islam? Please, the vehicle, Dr. Yeah, good morning. Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Rahlam. We are very thrilled to welcome you among us from Blida 2 University. Yes, good morning. She's going to present a lightning talk for five minutes in, in title. Yeah, Dr. Rahlam, can you hear me? Please uh, try um, try to uh, I mean, uh, uh, put off the echo that's coming from your mic. Of course. Thank you so much. So, I'm Dr. Here. Ahlam, I'm here with you. Dr. Ahlam Hamzawi is going to present a five minutes what lightning talk on intercultural communication. Yeah. Is it a tool for enhancing intercultural exchange or increasing tension in today's globalized world? So, uh, Dr. Hamzawi, the screen is yours. Would you please share with us your lightning talk? Please, you've got five minutes, then we'll move on to the debate. If Dr. Wafa will okay. join us, otherwise we will have a debate on the ah, two not more than five, okay. Yeah? May you see the screen, please? Yeah, certainly. May you see the screen, please? Just a second. It's not Are yet shared. Are you seeing shared. the slides? No, no, no Dr. Ahlam, no. Ahlam, you will share your screen or we will yes. share it? Okay. Will you do it yourself, Dr. Ahlam? As you like, as you like. If you can do it, for go yourself. ahead. The, okay. the presentation go home, is already ready. Go to do it by yourself. If it doesn't work, Dr. Kerima yes. is going to share it instead. So if yeah, please do it. Do it. Yeah, please okay. do it. You share the presentation, please the slides. All right, Dr. Kerima, would you please share it instead? Thank you. Um, okay, just give us a moment. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Ah, okay. Upload the file. Okay. Okay. Once it's done, you click on it to add it. Okay. 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 Yeah, so, it's child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, uh, you, would you please start to presenting? Whenever you want to move on to the next slide, you just say next, and they okay. are controlled. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So first, I'd like to thank quickly Dr. Menel, as well as all the scientific and organizing committee for giving us the chance and the opportunity to participate in this very important national conference. In fact, I'm here to learn because this is not my field of speciality. I had, in fact, uh, attended the first very first presentations and I have really learned a lot of things. So I want to share with you just this uh, high lightning talk, which is entitled Intercultural Communication. Is it a tool for enhancing intercultural exchange or increasing tensions in today's globalized world? Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. So any direct conversation between, yeah, you move, please. Just you move. The slide before this one, please. The third one. The third. So may you please. Très bien. Yeah. Yeah. Any direct conversation between individuals or groups of individuals from various cultures is generally considered to be as instance of intercultural communication. Next, please. In other words, the term refers to small scale face to face interactions between strangers in interpersonal communication. However, in a broader sense, the phrase is also although less frequently 
used to refer to direct or indirect exchanges or contacts between ethnic groups, states, or cultures. Next, please. Globalization refers to the expansion of social relations and consciousness across world time and world space. Next. So globalization makes intercultural communication easier and efficient for individuals throughout the world. Next. Indeed, intercultural communication has an impact on globalization. While it has brought effective commercial influences, at the same time, it tends to ruin cultures and their ethos. Further, when cultures meet or intersect, complexities often increase. Next, please. The overall process whereby the location of production, transmission, and reception of cultures ceases to be geographically fixed, partly as a result of technology, but also through international media structure and organization. Next, please. Many cultural consequences are predicted to follow especially the delocalizing of content and undermining of local cultures. These may be regarded as positive when local cultures are enriched by new impulses and creative hybridization occurs. Next, please. More often, they are viewed as negative because of threats to cultural identity, autonomy, and integrity. Intercultural communication is widely thought to be accelerating the process of globalization. Next, please. Next, please. So to conclude in few words, the need for intercultural communication skill is obvious. We are all working in an interconnected global world, and it is important to build good relationships with people from other cultures. This leads to better mutual understanding. So in other words, globalization and intercultural communication go hand in hand. So globalization, in, in fact, paved the way for intercultural communication. When we say globalization, we are speaking about different aspects, political, economic, cultural, and of course, in order to communicate with people, with communities, with groups, with um, organizations throughout the world, the need for intercultural communication is a need. So this is briefly uh, my high lightning talk, and thank you so much for waiting uh, for the debate for your questions. Many thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahlam, for this, for, uh, I mean, being precise and concise and respecting time. I'd like to invite once again, Dr. Nawari, I guess he's not among us. So we open the debate right now. Dr. Nawari, she didn't join, I guess. So um, let me invite our guests also, Dr. Fouad Bourbon and Dr. Um, Rizwan Arsalan and Dr. Taya Karima, who is moderating the session with me on this lightning talk, all together for an open debate. Of course, the attendees also are mostly welcome for the, uh, I mean, we open the discussion for any kinds of comments or questions or added any fruitful information so that we can enrich all together the debate. Yes, Dr. Rizwan, would you like to say something? Dr. Rizwan, we cannot hear you. Would you please mute your mic? Yeah, thank you so much. Doctor Rizwan? Yes, it's muted. Would you please mute yourself? Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Would you please write in the chat box? We may help you solve the problem. 
Dr. Fuad Bulkron, are you with us? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yeah, very warm welcome. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, uh, really, I'm really, I'm really happy, happy to be here today. Uh, I'm very obliged and thankful to Dr. Uh, Manal Mizab uh, for having invited me. I would have preferred to share my own work and presentation, but things went, you know, uh, not as expected. I passed through uh, some circumstances that make it impossible for me, you know, to uh, uh, present then, but now I am, you know, uh, it's possible for me. Uh, well, uh, without uh, delaying, uh, the topic is of interest to many and to me especially. And I'd like to raise uh, questions that are important in my eyes, but uh, they're not questions as such. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you. Okay. Um, the questions I'm gonna raise, uh, they're not questions as such, but they are, you know, uh, points or issues that uh, invite others to think about and okay. to reflect upon. Uh, especially with regard to the first presentation of Dr. Samia Shafawi from Laghwat University, uh, entitled Raising Cultural and Intercultural Awareness Among EFL Students. Uh, now, what, I, uh, what comes to my mind is to ask about uh, the following uh, questions. Now, what of the na notion of, uh, of uh, native speakerism? Uh, we know that in, uh, uh, when we are to, to, to teach a foreign language, we are expected to develop a certain communicative competence, a communicative competence where the native speaker is uh, at the center of the stage, is the focus of attention. So we need as language teachers, and we need as language teachers to develop in our learners a certain norm of the native speaker. But when we, when, when, when the pendulum shifted to developing an intercultural communicative competence. Instead of the narrower concept of communicative competence, here we raise the question, where does the native speaker stand? What about his norms? Should teachers give up the concept of communicative competence? I mean, if we adhere to the notion of intercultural communicative competence, which, um, how to say it, uh, demands that we forget about the speaker, the native speaker and his norms. The norms which Chomsky himself, uh, you know, in, uh, invoked uh, years or decades ago, speaking, <coughs> sorry, speaking about the ideal native speaker hearer who can produce and understand, you know, uh, sentences or utterances in uh, never heard or spoken uh, before. So this is what the native speaker is all about and what he can do. But when we speak about intercultural communicative competence and we try to develop it in our learners and in ourselves uh, as well, now we are asking, uh, should we adhere to uh, the notion of communicative competence or should we forget about it all and adhere to the uh, intercultural uh, notion. What I mean here is that in, inter, in trying to develop intercultural communicative competence, one does not content oneself only with the, uh, the native speaker, but with one's culture and one's, you know, language. Which means that when we try to behave interculturally, we try at least to, um, to, to, to make room for our own culture. And here, there is the danger, there is the threat of uh, forgetting about the native speaker norm. And more than that, we may, we may you know, invoke the idea of inter, interlanguage. Selinker, uh, decades ago, invoked the uh, notion of uh, uh, interlanguage. 
And as we all know, the idea, it means that uh, a learner, when he uses a language, a second language, he is neither using his first language nor is he, uh, is he using his uh, target second language. He is using a mixture, what we call an interlanguage, an interlanguage that uh, happens to coexist at the same time, sharing similar, sharing uh, areas or features and forms of the first language and, and forms of the target language. And here, his interlanguage becomes, you know, deviant because we speak about error, speak about mistakes. It means what, 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 the, what, what the learner, what the second and fourth language learner is using, is learning, is developing, is what we call an interlanguage that is not perfect as the native speaker, you know, uh, is or as he is in his first language. And because of that, there is, uh, we invoke the idea of committing mistakes and committing uh, errors. And this brings me to the question, is it, is the notion of intercultural communicative competence prone to the same uh, errors, problems, uh, uh, deviance, you know, if you want, of, uh, of what, of what uh, uh, the, the first language learner uh, is, uh, happens to commit, you see. So, so uh, can we speak about uh, his intercultural communicative competence as an incompetence, just like he, uh, when we do with, with the interlanguage? Is it a failure when we try to develop intercultural communicative competence in our learners? Is it a sign of incomplete acquisition because you are not adhering to the norms of the native speaker? I know that by now uh, the issue of native speakerism uh, is, uh, is uh, dated, you see, especially with the coming of age of intercultural communicative competence. But as I said before I started, uh, well, these are questions which we need to raise in order to situate ourselves and know where what we are supposed to do as teachers vis-a-vis -vis our learners, which means should we uh, be uh, uh, content when we try to develop in them intercultural communicative competence, or should we be concerned rather because we are leading them away from the norms of the uh, native speaker. Well, uh, I stop it here. Maybe I try, I try to... to yeah, yeah, uh, uh, another. Another. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fouad. Well, you know, I personally have learned from you right now. You are, it seems that you are very well versed regarding uh, such an issue. Uh, and I wish that you were among the speakers, not only participating in the debate, since you have much to say about such a topic. Right now, let's uh, open the discussion to, um, I mean, uh, Dr. Rizwan Arsalan. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Arsalan. Okay, thank okay, you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, there's no echo. Yeah? Yes, can you, yes. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we do. We do. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. We can, um, we can. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Burkron for his intervention, um, a critical intervention. Uh, I would just would like to say that this is not my technically my field of expertise. I focus on the question of the intercultural in general from a literary point of view. And um, I, um, with, with great pleasure, I heard uh, the, um, the presentation this morning. And I, I would just would like to tie the questions that Dr. Uh, Bulkron has has um, posed with those of, of globalization. I mean, there's always a context in which we interact. And um, the question of the interlanguage, I understand it from my point of view, at least, also is tied to that question of cultural translation. We're always engaged in some sort of cultural translation between us and let's say the foreigners or the native, the native speaker. Um, I think when we talk about intercultural, we talk about a common ground, so to speak. Uh, yes? Uh, 
Yes, please. Dr. Baswan, can you hear us? Yes, please. Yeah, I it can seems you, that yes. you have a problem, a connection problem. Your uh, debate is interrupted every time. Would you check your I'm connection, sorry. please? Uh, maybe I should yeah, stop. Yeah, can understand ca that. Uh, maybe I should stop the camera, perhaps, for the yeah. connection. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so as, as I was saying, I think the, uh, the the problem of intercultural communication, uh, I think, is associated with that of, 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 of cultural translation. And when we talk about cultural translation, there's always a common ground that we try to find with the, let's say, the foreigner, the other. Um, and I think we should, one thing that we should teach our students is that, you know, um, and this is a question that uh, Goethe, who was a well-known writer in the 19th century, posed, you cannot know other languages unless you know yours. Or to put it otherwise, those who do not know other languages do not know nothing of their own. And I think there's, there's, um, there's, uh, there should be some allowance for danger in the dialogue. Um, you, we can talk about certain kinds of incompetences when, when it comes to language, for instance. Uh, we are bound to make some mistakes. But I think this is the level of language. On the level of culture, on the level of values, on the level of norms, I think there should be some kind of implicit understanding of the shared common ground. And if there are things we do not share with the other, I think it helps to uh, teach our students how to communicate, how to articulate um, our agreement or our disagreement with the other. Otherwise, I think um, we, we risk, let's say, falling prey to this idea that we cater to the other because we are in a, let's say, um, in, a, in, a, in a, a powerless position, a position of, of you know, uh, of domination or, or being dominated rather than uh, uh, in a position of domination. So there has to be some kind of shared understanding between the, the you know, um, the second language speaker and the first language speaker. Otherwise, I think communication wouldn't wouldn't occur. Um, I also would like to comment briefly. I know I, I know I have only five minutes. Comment briefly on uh, Dr. Afaf's uh, presentation in the morning. And I think that's a question that needs to be asked, that needs to be debated, that needs to be brought to the fore. Um, the the question of uh, methodology, the question of theory, and so on, um, that we import from the north. And I think we, we, we must, I think as teachers, uh, at least on an advanced undergraduate level, and at least at the level of masters, we need to encourage our students, not simply to, let's say, understand uh, uh, the theories and the methodologies and so on that, that we import from the West, but to try to filter them. We try to filter them critically. We try to um, see what works and what doesn't. And we try to put our imprint um, at the end of the day, I think we, we are all trying to teach students so that they become, at least uh, in an advanced and uh, postgraduate level, producers of knowledge. We do not want producers of knowledge who simply echo what is produced elsewhere. And I understand that there are institutional, let's say, um, obstacles to that. But I think one obstacle that we can overcome at the local level is that we need to engage critically with theories and so on and methodology, methodologies that are produced elsewhere. And, you, and we need to be aware also of the context in which we discuss those, uh, uh, those forms of knowledge so that we can produce our own forms of knowledge that are not only, I think, beneficial to us, but also beneficial to others. And I think this is something, for instance, that some researchers in the Doha Institute are doing now, for instance. Um, uh, especially in the social sciences and sociology and so on, um, they are trying to produce some, some forms of knowledge about, let's say, local issues and so on, that is also in dialogue with what is produced elsewhere. I think this is just on, on, on an advanced level, uh, just because Dr. Afaf brought it up uh, this morning. I would, love, I would love to engage with, with, this, um, with this topic when it comes to teaching literature and so on, but I think the debate in this uh, in this section is much I think uh, is much more linked to, to the question of, of intercultural learning and intercultural communication. So I think I should stop here. If you have any questions or if you wish to further the debate, I would be happy to. Uh, but I think I should I should stop here. Uh, 
thank you, Dr. Rosman, for your uh, debates and comments. No problem. Uh, actually, I have questions uh, because I consider myself today uh, learning uh, from the field of uh, interculturality and the cultural awareness. Uh, actually, I have first question targets to the first presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, Samia Shafawi. Uh, Dr. Samia? Okay, <laughs> I think she she left. No, I'm here. Samia. Ah, great. Okay, uh, you mentioned two concepts, which I found them uh, like um, uh, critical whenever we talk about uh, uh, cultural awareness. Uh, I, I need to make uh, or uh, filtering the relationship between self-identification and uh, yeah. cultural awareness. Yeah. Okay, I and even, simply, yes, yes, please. I can simply make it like this way. The students we receive each year, like first year students, each time they come to the English department or it could be at any other department, they think that studying the language, they need to act accordingly, according to the norms, the attitudes, the, the, everything according to the language. And they fall victims to, I mean, I mean, the consequences will, will, will be very bad. We, we had examples of students who ended up even not believing in God and forgetting about religion and asking for a refugee to go abroad. We had examples of uh, students of, of this type. They have even had a, a sacred community of practicing those things. And we teachers really felt very bad. And we never thought that such a thing could exist in our uh, 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 university. So our job as teachers, self, um, uh, what is it that you said, self? I just am running out of the, the concept. So our job as teachers is by the beginning of the uh, IT class or whatever the class is, we, we have to make sure that the students know our own uh, like uh, religious background, cultural background, and say that this is what they think, I mean, the, the, the Western world, be it the, the, the British or the Americans or uh, whatsoever, okay? So we highlight the, the differences to the students and always remind them that we are studying the language to communicate for different purposes, that there is a purpose that they are studying the language. So it could be going abroad, it could be becoming a teacher, it could be working in a foreign company. So we need to remind them that they should stick always stick to their own culture and especially a religious background and not to fall victims to such behaviors or uh, attitudes things in the future so this is our job i i highly recommend if i were in higher position i would recommend that for first year students there should be a module entitled uh, raising cultural and intercultural awareness because awareness. not all the teachers are doing unfortunately the thing but like like raising awareness about the culture and the foreign language culture our own culture so i highly recommend there should be something uh, done about this to make the students uh, well aware of their own uh, heritage and religious heritage and cultural heritage and whatsoever Indeed, Dr. Samia, I totally joined my voice to yours because yes. I, my comment is that I would like, I would love, sorry, to yes. practically speak in here about real case studies or yes. specific examples of successful yes. cultural awareness initiatives in EFL classrooms. Unfortunately, we are all the time discussing such issues, hearing conferences and writing articles, but practically speaking, we would like to invite any responsibles or those who are concerned about writing canvas to create a module about raising cultural awareness. Yeah, I totally join my voice to yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, can I just uh, can I just jump in? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yes, um, yes. I, I would like to to reflect on this um, on this point from uh, from the perspective of teaching literature, and um, and I say this specifically because um, uh, unfortunately, the teaching of literature or the humanities in general, I think we do not are not um, let's say aware of their essential function. For instance, when I teach. Um, let's say, uh, foreign texts um, written by a British 
you know, modern British writer. What I try to focus on is not just how it historically, you know, reflects um, a certain experience uh, related to their own culture, but also how the text itself as literature looked specifically from an artistic point of view at something particular to their culture and articulated it in such a way that it has become relatable to all human beings elsewhere. This is the key point, I think, about teaching literature. So I encourage the students when they read literature or word literature, um, any great work of literature involves this movement from what is particular to that which is universal. What I mean by particular, I mean the culture, and the culture is not one thing, of course. That's why when you have access to literature, you have access to the multiple manifestation of culture, albeit it's just one culture. But, but a great literary text must provide certain universal reflections about what it is to be human. And I try to encourage the students to think about their own, let's say, situation, their own upbringing, um, their, their own context of reading, their own context of living, and try to do something similar. Or try to, to, you know, reflect on their own, let's say, experiences culturally and politically and socially and so on and so forth in our country here, because reading literature has allowed them to do so. Um, and, he, and, I, and I would like to propose something, and, I, and, and this is far-fetched, I know, but this is something that's done, for example, in some universities in Canada, Canada some universities in Qatar, bilingual education, especially when it comes to literature. We teach in two languages. And I know this, this could be done at a more advanced level, I am aware of that, but I think this is what would really enrich, I think, um, um, intercultural awareness. Uh, without losing what is, of course, specific to us, culturally speaking, um, and also to, in, to, to, in, to encourage our students to be, be creative, um, to look into their own culture, to look into aspects of their own culture that await, let's say, some kind of re artistic representation, and make of that something that is, let's say, relatable to other human beings elsewhere. They could do that in English, for instance, but they have to have certain critical awareness of their own culture and the other's culture to be able to do so. Um, they should, and, and, and I'm aware that in, in creativity, in, 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 we, shouldn't, we shouldn't use the words here, they should, but I think they need to have some kind of awareness of what's specific to them, what's peculiar to them, and present it in such a way that it makes sense artistically and creatively speaking to other people. So I am here trying to propose something which is maybe bilingual programs in creative writing, for instance. Um, um, and I think this is something that needs to be more encouraged in our universities, at least at, at, uh, on an MA level. This is what I'm trying to, uh, this is what I had in mind even before, I think, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the conference. I have had this idea for a long time. I don't know how it could be applied institutionally, but I think pedagogically we can think about this together. And I think it could be applied based on the fact that most of us are bilinguals or multilinguals. And I think we need to, we must, Take advantage of this, of our multilingualism, uh, and, and, and in such a way that it benefits us. Because in globalization, there's always an even, it says an uneven stage in which uh, we are not or we are underrepresented. How do we make sure that in this uneven stage of globalization, we belong to, of course, what is called the global south? How do we make sure that our voice is heard? Um, um, such that it does justice to us, but it also is aware of like the current, you know, um, uh, uh, status of, of culture, of knowledge production, and so on and so forth. So, to 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 finish, I am I am simply calling for some kind of um, some kind of uh, you know a movement between, let's say, openness, but also rootedness, and this movement must be critical and creative at the same at the same time. Uh, this is what I have to say for for now. Uh, um, can can everyone hear me? Yeah, we do. We do. We yes. are really enjoying okay. listening to you, Doctor as well. So we are so fully concentrated in what you are saying. Yeah. <laughs> so this is what I have to say for now. I mean, um, there are so many other elements that are related to what I'm trying to say, but I think I need to be concise and precise here. This is what I what I wanted to say, um, and I I I leave the you know.
thank you so much, Dr. Lisbon. Um, I totally agree with you. You were providing us with very please, interesting. Please, 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 if you don't mind. Yes. Yeah. Please, 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 if you don't mind, I want to address an issue to Dr. Manel. Is this is uh, Dr. Hamzawi? If you don't mind, I want to address an issue to Dr. Manel. If you don't mind, please. Yeah, Dr. Manel, are you with us? Dr. Manel, yeah. Dr. Karima, can you please invite Dr. Manel? She is addressing an issue. Dr. Ahlam Hamzawi. So she is here ahead. with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, today's topic about this very interesting national uh, conference was about intercultural communication uh, in uh, the wake of going global, isn't it? So, and as we all know that this phenomenon of globalization that has taken place after the end of the Cold War um, and exactly in the 1990s, is um, today or currently starting to uh, disappear or to decrease its impact and influence upon uh, nations worldwide. So sooner or later, in other words, this globalization is going to have an end. And certainly because of those different um, events, conflicts that are taking part in different um, parts of the world, um this this globalization is going to be replaced certainly by another system so um since you are the president of this uh, very interesting national uh, uh, conference i'd like thinking after globalization so here we are speaking about intercultural commu communicative competence in globalization or in the wake of going global so globalization here is a key word what about after this globalization? Is this communicative competence uh, or intercultural communicative competence or approach is going to be the same regardless in teaching literature or civilization, didactics, language sciences, in teaching generally speaking? Because when we say intercultural communication here, we are speaking also about culture and we are also speaking about the language, which is one of the very very main important part, Surja, as considering myself always a student, we want maybe in the future throughout all communicative competence or approach is going to be the same after globalization. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, kind of a comment and uh, kind of a recommendation as well. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, we may consider studying intercultural communication in a post-globalization era, for example. But um, to the best of my knowledge, um, globalization is outdated somehow because now we're dealing with internationalization instead. Globalization mm -hmm. used to uh, make those international forces monopolize every sphere of human exactly. life. But with internationalization now, we're trying to adopt those dimensions that, that are uh, used um, abroad, that is international, global, and intercultural dimensions. And we can even bring them here to our country. So for example, um, in higher education, we cannot send uh, every teacher and every student to have training abroad. So we can bring what foreigners are doing or what experts are doing abroad to the country per se. Uh, like for example, design curricula that are, um, that are uh, fused with intercultural content, for example. We can have, we can invite speakers or scholars that deal with interculturality to speak at conferences, at international workshops, so that we, uh, we benefit from the knowledge they have. But uh, we ourselves, to make our voices heard, especially uh, what concern, about what concerns um, our cultures, because we don't have only one culture, and our conceptions and worldviews uh, of interculturality. 
Um, if we go back in the in the years when we were master students, we didn't even have a module called culture or intercultural communication. That's why I said at the beginning in the opening that uh, for uh, for the north or for the west, yeah, interculturality seems outdated because they have dealt with it a lot. But when it comes to us, it's only since 2013 that we started dealing with intercultural topics. Uh, I remember in my doctorate, there were only four doctoral theses that deal with intercultural communicative competence at the time. So, as I said, we, di we didn't used to have programs that are or that deal with interculturality but with uh, the Sokol comma introduced in 2015 2016 there were uh, some uh, or uh, uh, there were some modules or subjects that deal with intercul or explicitly uh, with interculturality like in the masters we have language and and if you uh, go through the content or the syllabus of the subject you may figure out that uh, there, there is a lesson about intercultural communicative competence, intercultural communication, intercultural language teaching, and so on and so forth. Even if we uh, go to the to the option of literature and civilization, there is a module of teaching culture in EFL classes. So here, didactically speaking, we are trying to prepare the students on how to tackle culture and interculturality and how to teach it. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. May, may I join in or rejoin in? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Explanations. Anything? Thanks, Dr. Uh, so I thank uh, all the participants who have contributed insightful information, uh, departing from their uh, experiences and expertise. And now I would like to uh, take the uh, discussion further, a step further, uh, because we often hear it said that we need as teachers to develop certain uh, intercultural awareness. And I put focus here on the word awareness, but it seems that awareness is uh, uh, difficult to approach. And especially because of its association. It has become guilty by association with the notion of uh, consciousness. You know, that consciousness, we cannot uh, research it, we cannot test it, we cannot measure it. And researchers need to find an instrument, a tool uh, uh, that measures awareness as such. So uh, at the end of the day, after teaching you know, uh, some intercultural communicative competence and develop some awareness of it, how can we be sure that there is awareness indeed if awareness itself cannot be tested uh, empirically? In fact, the notion of awareness and intercultural communication and awareness in language teaching has come of age, especially right now, and I join my colleagues who said that in Algeria, Dr. Menel said that in Algeria it is uh, uh, making a big sound, you know, that elsewhere it is dated. And I join my voice to hers. But still, researchers have, uh, you know, urged the need to avoid the notorious umbrella, you know, term, which is consciousness. And they, 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 they use uh, instead what we call awareness. So how, what is first awareness? And how can we develop it in our learners? How can we be sure? How can we claim with certainty? And, uh, and uh, you know, how can we be sure that indeed there is awareness on the part of our learners that we as teachers, we have succeeded in building it, in, in, in developing it, or should we just repeat empty words? Empty words like uh, we try to develop awareness on, uh, on the part of our learners without being sure of that. So we need to understand uh, before all, uh, in the first place, we have to understand what is meant by awareness. In fact, scholars, uh, scholars and researchers uh, have, you know, cut the term consciousness into 
four main notions. One is intention, the other is awareness, the other is control, and the fourth one is intentionality. And most, I mean, the bulk of, of the work focuses on awareness because it can be empirically, you know, defined. Schmidt, in 1990, 1993, even in 2001, and uh, later, in, in investigating the role of consciousness in learning, distinguishes several meanings of the term. And when it comes to cutting it into, into its components, we see that awareness can be, men, uh, can be used to mean perception. It can be used to mean noticing, and it can be used to mean understanding. So these are three hierarchical uh, levels or components of, uh, uh, you know, uh, awareness. Awareness cannot be dealt with directly. If you want to build intercultural awareness, you cannot, you know, deal with it, uh, build it directly. But there are indirect ways of dealing with it. You have to catch the notion of uh, awareness into three main, you know, uh, components. The first of which is what we call perception. And as we know, we can perceive whatever we are exposed to in terms of um, stimuli and uh, we still are not aware of them. Which means that now I can see the door, I can see the computer, I can see, uh, uh, I can see you and I can see uh, uh, other things as well. But I'm not conscious of them. It is only when we orient our attention to them can we be conscious of them? And when we try to orient our perception to something, say an intercultural feature, a difference between one culture and another, or a linguistic aspect, if we happen to be language teachers apart from the cultural aspects. Here, if we try to orient our perception uh, and come to notice the intercultural feature as such, then, we call it noticing. And noticing is conscious awareness because there is awareness that is perceptual, that is not conscious. Think of all the things that you can perceive now and you are not aware of them. You can see a number of colors, a number of persons, a number of objects, but we are not aware of them. It is only when we try to orient our attention and our perception can we notice the thing and then only then noticing happens. When noticing happens, uh, Schmidt calls it acquisition. It means you have acquired, you have learned, you have successfully developed knowledge of the culture, of the language form, of the uh, cultural and intercultural features that are part of one, our own culture, but also the culture of the other. So we need to develop noticing. There is, uh, there is the noticing hypothesis. We need to develop noticing in our learners if we want to build any awareness on their part. You see, uh, many ways, uh, there are diff different uh, ways that are conducive to what we call noticing. Uh, one of which, if we try to uh, take note of, uh, of uh, what uh, textbooks are used in the middle school, in the secondary school, in even the primary school, we see that they highlight the features, whether they be linguistic or cultural or intercultural, you see, they highlight them. And this is a technique which we call input enhancement. So we enhance the input. We make it salient in order for, for us to call and draw the attention of the learners to notice it. And as we know, when they come to notice uh, the thing, the intercultural feature, the difference between our own culture and the other culture, then acquisition happens and competence is built. And uh, there are different techniques uh, which uh, Rod Ellis and uh, Schmidt and even Sherwood Smith uh, propose in order for uh, teachers to utilize and make noticing happen and make acquisition happen. So this is but a contribution in order to uh, uh, invite certain reflections upon them. And thank you very much for listening.
indeed, Dr. Bingronto had. I guess such an issue, Manel, one of the recommendations, Dr. Manel, is that you have to organize another international conference because <laughs> I guess we have much to say. So this is one of the recommendations from this conference. We call for an international conference on interculturality. <laughs> inter no worries. <laughs> we'll try to take that recommendation into consideration. And another mm -hmm. recommendation is to have the conference on site. Never yeah. do it online. Yeah, indeed. indeed, yeah. We want to come to Tbilisi University first. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. I guess, uh, Dr. Manel, uh, if you allow me to close, I mean, these lightning talks, because I guess it's high time uh, we had a lunch break. Yes. So thank you so much for all your contributions. Thank you for those lightning talks which have lighted our path towards such an interesting issue. Uh, I would like to thank once again uh, the hardworking uh, conference president, Dr. Manel Mizab, mm -hmm. the moderator, the uh, one who has saved today's today my face, Dr. Karima Taya, for <laughs> moderating, for co-moderating uh, the lightning you. talk. Uh, thank you so much. The um, uh, the speakers, uh, Dr. Ahlam and Dr. Um, Samia from Lahwat and Blida Two University. Thank you so much for the insightful presentations. I'd like also uh, to have a heartfelt congratulations on the debate on the ideas shared by both. Dr. Fuad Bulqron and Dr. Um, Azwan Arsalan, thank you so much indeed. It was a pleasure having you all today. Uh, looking forward to meeting you in person in an, an upcoming international event organized by the same shared presidents, say Dr. Karim Ataya and Dr. Menel Mizab in the uh, upcoming month, inshallah. So thank you so much. By doing so, we are closing Please this continue. lightning talk. We are looking oh, yeah? forward to meeting you on site uh, again mm -hmm. in uh, further upcoming scientific events, hopefully, inshallah. Inshallah. So we call right now for half an hour. Normally it was intended for 30, uh, one hour for lunch breaks, but now it's uh, almost one o'clock. So we have 30 minutes and please join back. Thank you so well, much actually indeed. We have, actually, yes. we have something uh, to say about uh, the break. Uh, I will give you the floor to the moderator of the national conference, our ex-students, uh, Hadid. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Dr. Karim, and thank you, Dr. Wafa Warniki. Uh, As we conclude this uh, insightful lightning talks, I want to express our sincere gratitude and heartfelt thanks to all the speakers and the doctors for their concise and insightful discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had an engaging and informative morning filled with insightful discussions and collaborations. Now it's time for a well-deserved break. Uh, the lunch break will last for approximately one hour. We kindly request you to return to your seats uh, promptly by two o'clock. And as we will resume the afternoon sessions, we will have the parallel workshops session. These workshops are designed to offer you a more specialized and hands-on experience on intercultural communication. Um, these workshops will run uh, currently providing you with the flexibility to choose the workshop that suits your interests. Uh, enjoy your lunch break and enjoy your chosen workshops. See you in the uh, closing event. Thank you. Okay, so see you soon.